What's up, y'all? Thank you for being here. Especially warm welcome if you are new, as always, Adventist or otherwise. Last week, we dove into a talk by celebrity SDA pastor Doug Batchelor that is titled, Is Sunday Sacred? It served as a good example of some of the common claims that the SDA church makes against first day Sabbatarians like myself, demonstrating that they do not know what they criticize in a number of areas, but especially this area. If you, uh, if you recall, our friend Doug has yet to even mention the new creation a single time. We're about 34 or so minutes into the presentation. He has engaged in uh, the standard fair SDA proof text, lots of assertions, and knocking down a bunch of straw men. Um, show me one verse in the Bible, lots of uh, verbatim fallacy type stuff. If you didn't see part one, no need to pop over there now. But some of what I might say uh, tonight might make some more sense if you have seen that part. As a reminder, yes, I know that not all Christians agree with me, especially former Adventists, and that's fine. But sharing is caring, like I said last time. The purpose of both part one and two is not to exhaustively cover every aspect of the Sabbath, but to primarily focus on the discussion within the context of two parties that do happen to agree on certain aspects, such as the Sabbath being a creation ordinance, but disagree on almost every other area. Um, as he made the wild assertion that many SDAs love to make, which is that there isn't a shred of biblical evidence for Christians worshiping on the first day, to which we saw actually means there isn't a single proof text in all of the Bible that verbatim says go to church on Sunday, those sorts of things. Because Doug has evidence for us that they don't even understand the arguments and aren't even in the conversation, which Doug is going to further evidence for us tonight. Last week, he went through all of the first day passages of scripture, as well as some uh, rhetorical questions asking a, a number of things like, uh, did the apostles change it? Uh, is Well, you're going to see he's actually going to do a couple more here before he then transitions into uh, history. If you are a former Adventist, lots of this is going to sound very familiar to you. Some of the citations he's going to bring up, you will most assuredly have heard touted by some Adventist somewhere before. But if you haven't actually looked into those, you're in luck. Because tonight, we will be. And we will see that Doug's analysis of history is just as bad as his handling of the biblical text last week. With that said, let's get back into it. Uh, my, uh, how do Christians remember Jesus' death? Is it a new Sabbath day? Or did Christ give us something? The Bible tells us that Romans chapter 6 verse 3 do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Has Christ given us something to remember his resurrection? Yes. Is it a new Sabbath? No. What is it? Baptism. Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father even so we should walk in a newness of life. The death, burial, resurrection of the Lord is not replaced by a new uh, Sabbath day. It is memorialized by baptism, is a reminder of the resurrection. Colossians 2.12, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Isn't that clear? Say amen. You're, I think you're very quiet today. Did you catch the switcheroo? He asked how Christians are to remember Jesus' death and then said, resurrection. No, Doug, baptism isn't about remembering Jesus' death. That is not what Paul said in Romans 6. Nor does he say baptism was given to remember the resurrection. That's not what was said in those verses. Especially for people who oftentimes are holding others, like we showed last week, to the standard of the verbatim fallacy. There's nothing in there about a memorial. Where's the word memorial in there, Doug? Show me one verse in there, or one word in there where, where, where it says in that verse, memorial. That's the standard you were holding us to last week. But first, the claim is not that the first day is to remember Jesus' death or resurrection, but redemption. We went through that last week, and, and 
ad nauseum on this platform at this point, which was accomplished by that work of resurrection. Not just that, but that was the final step. And that brought about the new creation. The creation that fell was redeemed, which is why Exodus roots the Sabbath in creation and Deuteronomy roots it in redemption. SDAs do not see this because they often are not being taught to look at the entirety of the biblical narrative or when they can't even look at it without the great controversy theme to do the filtering for them. But instead, they look at it in small sound bites from all over the place that seem to, to, to fit with what they're claiming, or they think do, like Doug just did. Oh, it talks about baptism and talks about us, and so it, it, baptism is a memorial. The, the great controversy theme, folks, completely obstructs the SDA mind from being able to rightly see what Christ's coming was actually about. Because in their system, it wasn't to accomplish redemption. No, it was primarily to vindicate God against accusations made by Satan in a pre-earth existence. And that process entails a seven-step program, seriously, <laughs> their entire sanctuary model of seven steps, which Jesus is currently going through himself, and he's at step five, the investigative judgment. Until this entire chain of stuff is complete, Jesus is still working on redemption because redemption actually revolves around vindicating his character against the accusations of a creature, namely Satan. So because this is the case, they do not understand what Jesus actually accomplished in his perfect obedience in a sinless life, death, burial, and resurrection. Which is, again, why we have not heard a single mention of new creation yet. But this is how interpretation works in Adventism. The great controversy theme is the lens through which everything in Scripture must be understood. Paul hinges the entirety of the good news on the person and work of Jesus. And hinges all of that on the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15. If he didn't resurrect, it's all in vain. He wasn't the Messiah. He wasn't the Son of God. Which is why in Romans 1-4, uh, it says the resurrection was the demonstration that he was who he says he was. Because if he would have remained in the tomb, it would have demonstrated he was a sinner. He died just like everyone else did and remained dead. But the fact that he resurrected demonstrated he was who he says he was. There's a lot that hinges on this. And baptism does not point to Jesus' resurrection. Both the person and work of Christ hinge on that final step. But furthermore, Doug is simply reiterating, as expected. Ellen White here, who claimed this in Spiritual Gifts Volume 1, notice, quote, I saw that angels were filled with amazement as they beheld the sufferings and death of the King of Glory. But I saw that it was no marvel to the angelic host that the Lord of life and glory, who filled all heaven with joy and splendor, should break the bands of death and walk forth from his prison house a triumphant conqueror. And if either of these events should be commemorated by a day of rest, it is the crucifixion. But I saw that neither of those events were designed to alter or abolish God's law, but they give the strongest proof of its immutability. Both of these important events have their memorials. By partaking of the Lord's Supper, the broken bread and the fruit of the vine, we show forth the Lord's death until he comes. By observing this memorial, the scenes of his sufferings and death are brought fresh to our minds. The resurrection of Christ is commemorated by our being buried with him by baptism and raised up out of the watery grave in likeness of his resurrection to live in newness of life. Close quote. So Doug is basically just making the same claim. She claimed to be shown by God that neither the crucifixion or the resurrection were designed to alter or abolish the law, which First Day Sabbatarians are not claiming this. <laughs> and again, when the Adventist Church makes these arguments against Christians, it's really only against First Day Sabbatarians at the end of the day because other Christians don't even agree on categorically the same thing here. So these arguments basically just have to be made against first day Sabbatarians and they don't work. They, they're, it's irrelevant. But Doug made these same assumptions like he did last week that uh, it, it just it clearly shows an erroneous understanding. It's not claiming the law was abolished. But nevertheless, the telltale sign that she didn't receive this from God is that God himself changes the form of the fourth commandment in the second giving of the law in Deuteronomy. 
We looked at that last week. We've looked at that countless times. We have countless articles on this on the website. Clearly, Ellen didn't know what she criticized either. And either did the person who supposedly gave her this vision. But the point, as you can see, she claims the resurrection was memorialized by baptism, or is rather, when no, it isn't. How could a one-time ceremonial ordinance be how we remember the resurrection? Like they'll claim the weekly Sabbath is how one remembers the creator of heaven and earth by virtue of it being weekly and regularly occurring. But here they'll point to a one-time event, baptism, to say it memorializes the resurrection. That's not how memorials work. She's correct, the Lord's Supper in part, is a memorial of the death of Christ. That's not all it is, but it is in part. But even that doesn't function like a memorial in Adventism. It's done every 13th week or something like that, like four times a year, not weekly. Nevertheless, uh, baptism is a sign and seal of regeneration, and that's what Paul is getting at in Romans 6. Not that it's a memorial of the resurrection. Notice what Charles, uh, we're going to get back in Hodge's commentary here. We looked at him last week in regards to 1st and 2nd Corinthians. But notice what he lays out here. And I could have picked a number of people. So speaking on Romans 6, this is from his Romans commentary. He says, quote, As the gospel reveals the only effectual method of justification, so also it alone can secure the sanctification of men. To exhibit this truth is uh, uh, is the object of this and the following chapter. The sixth is partly argumentative and partly exhortatory. In verses 1 through 11, the apostle shows how unfounded is the objection that gratuitous justification, meaning justification freely given by God, leads to the indulgences of sin. Get that. Doug cited from verse from Romans 6, 3 and 4. Hodge points out, which we're going to look at, in verses 1 through 11, the apostle shows how unfounded is the objection that gratuitous justification leads to the indulgences of sin. That is what is in view in Romans 6. In verses 12 through 23, he exhorts Christians to live agreeably to the nature and design of the gospel and presents various considerations adapted to secure their obedience to this exhortation. So notice, folks. Paul is building an argument and laying out a theology as the book of Romans is unfolding. And the reason we're going to dig in on this for for a minute, even though this isn't a super big point that he made, is it's going to prove a bigger point of how the SDA church is known to handle the Bible. And that will become much clearer as we go along here. Chapters 1 through 3 deal with the nature of fallen man and the horrible condition he is in apart from Christ, both Jew and Gentile alike. Apart from Christ... All are unrighteous and fall short of the glory of God. That's the summation of of chapters 1 through 3. Chapters 4 and 5 then deal with the remedy to that problem, and he then uses Abraham as an example, pointing to Genesis 15. He says Abraham was credited uh, righteousness when he believed God, and it was that faith in God, belief and trust in him that justified him, using that as the example of the freely given grace or, or justification of God which would mean justification has to do with being seen as righteous in God's sight. If Abraham was credited righteousness based on his belief and he was justified, that means that justification has to do with righteousness in God's sight. He then explains that this justification brings a sinner to peace with God, Romans 5.1. And then in five through chapter 5, he then explains how fallen man is born with uh, the first Adam as their representative, but when one believes the gospel, they are transferred from the fallen, condemned family of Adam into the righteous family of Jesus Christ, uh, who, as the second Adam, is then their new representative that they are seen as righteous in. Transferred from a kingdom of darkness to kingdom of light. This is a consistent theme with Paul. He talks about this in 1 Corinthians as well, the, the first Adam and the second Adam, etc. It's 1 Corinthians 15. But by the time he gets to chapter 6, all of that has already been laid out. That's the flow of where we're at in the text now. The apostle then transitions to the objections that someone could bring to what he's presented thus far. Namely, that if it's the case that a person is freely justified by faith apart from works of the law, then why wouldn't someone just use that as a license to sin? He anticipates that question. He does this regularly throughout Romans. He does the same thing in chapter 9 which is exactly why he starts 6-1 by saying, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? 
So he asks this rhetorically as an example of someone who might bring this charge against what he just said. And Hodge rightly points out that Paul in verses 1 through 11 is refuting that charge by explaining that the freely justifying act of God upon a sinner does not produce licentiousness. Because there's far more to it than that. It's not, it, people are made a new creature in Christ. They have new desire. I mean, there's all sorts of things. They're born again. So Paul is essentially squashing that. Now notice what Hodge points out in verses 3 and 4, which is what Doug cited. Commenting on verse 3, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Hodge then comments, The apostle reminds his readers that the very design of Christianity was to deliver men from sin, that everyone who embraced it embraced it for that object, and therefore it was a contradiction in terms to suppose that any should come to Christ to be delivered from sin in order that they might live in it. And besides, or besides this, it is clearly intimated that such is not only the design of the gospel and the object of which it is embraced by all who cordially receive it, but also that the result or necessary effect of union with Christ is a particular or is a participation in the benefits of his death. We're going to read that again. And besides this, it is clearly intimated that such is not only the design of the gospel and the object of which it is embraced by all who cordially receive it, but also that the result or necessary effect of union with Christ is a participation in the benefits of his death. So contrary to the SDA church often claiming those Sunday Christians, they don't believe in obedience. They don't think Jesus actually frees people from sin. They have a powerless gospel. Let this be a testament that no, they're yet again wrong. Christians disagree with the SDA church's false doctrine around sinless perfectionism, which then results in them engaging in the false dilemma fallacy of thinking, if you disagree with them, you must be advocating for living it up in sin, as if those are the only two options, when that's not the case at all. But Paul here is laying out that baptism is a sign and seal of having union with Christ through his death. Hodge continues. When it is said that the Hebrews were baptized unto Moses, 1 Corinthians 10, 2, or when the apostle asks the Corinthians, were you baptized unto the name of Paul, 1 Corinthians 1, 13, or when we are said to be baptized unto Christ, the meaning is they were baptized in reference to Moses, Paul, or Christ, i.e. to be brought into union with them as their disciples or worshipers, as the case may be. In like manner, in the expression baptized into his death, the preposition expresses the design and the result. The meaning, therefore, is we were baptized in order that we should die with him, i.e., that we should be united to him in his death and be partakers of its benefits. Paul does not design to teach that the sacrament of baptism, from any inherent virtue in the right or from any supernatural power in him who administers it, or from any uniformity attending divine influence, always secures the regeneration of the soul. This is contrary both to, this is contrary both to scripture and experience. No fact is more obvious than that thousands of the baptized are unregenerate, it cannot be, therefore, that the apostle intends to say that all who are baptized are thereby savingly united to Christ. It is not of the efficacy of baptism as an external rite that he assumes his readers are well informed. It is of the import and design of that sacrament and the nature of the union with Christ of which baptism is the sign and seal. Close quote. So by baptized into his death, Hodge argues that the grammar Remember, the only approved hermeneutic in the SDA church, historical grammatical method. Okay, well, that's what Hodge is utilizing, because that's where they got this from. <laughs> Hodge argues, uh, argues that the grammar expresses the idea of baptism being a sign and seal of a person's union with Christ. Now, not all Christians agree with this, such as our Lutheran friends. But the purpose of this was in showing or the purpose in showing this was not to convince you of the reformed understanding of baptism, but to show this verse has nothing to do with baptism being a memorial of Jesus' death. <laughs> Paul is transitioning to responding to hypothetical arguments people could bring up against what he said regarding justification, such that if one is justified apart from works, why not just live it up in sin so grace can abound? He shuts that down by stating that the true Christian united to Christ was buried with him in baptism, and one who is truly united to Christ doesn't have such a mindset. He is pointing to baptism, the sign and seal of union with Christ in his death, to highlight that. 
The same thing is being said by Paul in Colossians 2, which actually shows the connection between baptism in the new covenant and circumcision in the old. Like I said in part one, there are old covenant forms, namely circumcision, Passover, and the seventh-day Sabbath. In the new creation, those old covenant forms take on new covenant forms. Passover to the Lord's Supper, circumcision to baptism, seventh-day Sabbath to the first-day Sabbath. So no, Doug, it isn't clear that Colossians 2 is saying that baptism is a memorial of the resurrection. And again, this whole presentation so far, Doug has held others to the verbatim fallacy, yet neither of the texts that he appealed to, neither of them, used the word memorial. And Doug, you still aren't utilizing the HGM, which Ted Wilson told us is the only approved hermeneutical method of the SDA church. You just cite verses, make assertions, and move along. Romans 6 and Colossians 2 pose literally zero problems for the Christian Sabbath position. But Colossians 2 actually does pose serious issues for your guys' position, as we're going to look at later since he mentions it again. But Doug here is beating up a straw man. He's seeking to refute the claim that the first day is not a memorial of Jesus' resurrection when first day Sabbatarians do not claim the first day is a memorial of the resurrection. It is a memorial of the new creation, the redemption, the work that was accomplished by the Lord Jesus, which the old sign, again, we talked about in part one, the seventh day pointed to that work that would be accomplished, just like circumcision pointed to it, just like Passover pointed to it, etc. When that has come to pass, there are now new forms in the new creation in the new covenant. The resurrection was the turning point from the old creation to the new. That's why resurrection is pointed to and celebrated. But the root is in what the resurrection demonstrates, which is that redemption was accomplished and the new creation has come. Exodus 20, roots it in creation. Deuteronomy 5, roots it in redemption. That's exactly what it's still rooted in. It just has a new form in the new covenant. And as was pointed out in the last part, Adventist, the ceremonial form of the fourth commandment not only can change, but has changed <laughs> multiple times in scripture. Not just after man fell into sin, but then in the second giving of the law in Deuteronomy, and then again in the new creation. So how does the Bible refer to the first day of the week? Is it a new Sabbath? Ezekiel 46, 1, Thus says the Lord God, The gateway of the inner court that faces towards the east shall be shut during the six working days, but the Sabbath it will be opened. The first day of the week is called a what? It's a regular working day. Now, you may be in a country where you can actually... Uh, be prosecuted for breaking what they call blue laws. There are some countries where uh, I know a lady, her father was put in jail in Canada because he was out working in his field on Sunday. Uh, there were times where you, you weren't allowed to work on Sunday. The laws of men. Again, just breezes on over this, makes an assertion, oh, the first day is only ever referred to as an ordinary, normal working day. We got more appeals to the old creation period prior to the redemption of creation being accomplished, and then he conflates that with the new creation that we're in now. <laughs> this is the problem with the proof text method of interpretation, folks. They think they have an infallible interpreter. They can just consult her. I was just in Judd Lake's book earlier, Ellen White Under Fire, getting ready to do a stream on that. And it, it just, it, it blows my mind. It, he just, multiple times in the book, he just admits Yet SDAs will deny this. Well, she's the lens through which the Bible, you know, she, she the, as the lesser light, she's the lens that we're to go to the Bible with. And then she helps us really bring out the gems of the Bible. We can really understand it. Yeah, right. She's the infallible interpreter. Well, no. Okay, well, then that's what your Sabbath school quarterly says. So then we'll just appeal to that where it verbatim says the infallible book needs an infallible interpretation in order to arrive at the correct destination. So, but this is how it works. They just cite these verses because that's the approved thing from either the guys at the BRI or, and, and they've consulted Ellen White or, or uh, you know, what have you. But because that's the case, well, then it's just, they know it's biblical. When, no, they just do these drive-bys and make these assertions. They fail to look at the bigger picture from Genesis to Revelation to see where the narrative is going and what the real substance actually is. The only reason one would think these verses somehow refutes the Christian Sabbath position is if they don't understand it. 
which Doug clearly doesn't. And I think that's clear at this point. They assume the ceremonial form of the command cannot change, yet it does change. Doug already admitted in part one, days were created. He claimed God created the seventh day on the seventh day. Yet then he cites where Jesus said Sabbath was made, made for man, not angels. They believe it's eternal. They think the seventh day has an eternal aspect to it, to where it was being observed prior to the creation of the earth. Yet Doug claims the seventh day was created on the seventh day. It's like, do you guys listen to yourselves? Days are dependent upon the sun and moon, which are also a part of creation. Again, all of the other uh, all the other unfallen worlds that they believe in, they think they're all uh, observing the Ten Commandments. So, are there like a bunch of parallel timelines with like, and it's like the seventh day here, but it's the, it could be a different, <laughs> just crazy, man. Think about this, folks. All these other unfallen life forms on all the other worlds they believe in. They all observe the Ten Commandments, supposedly. That's why they're unfallen. Which would mean the seventh day wasn't actually created like Doug claimed. Because days were already in existence, even before the creation of the earth. But in their minds, if you say the ceremonial form of the command has changed, you've changed something that's immutable. When no, days are not eternal. That's not the aspect of the command that's eternal. The substance of it is. And the substance of the fourth commandment is that the one true God is due worship, honor, and praise by virtue of who he is. He always has been, always will be worthy of that. That's the eternal aspect, not the seventh day. They've taken the language of others, which is why I get so worked up about this, such as some of the Puritans, the Reformers, and then twisted what those men were saying to try and say, well, the SDA church just believes the same thing those people did. When no, none of them agreed that the seventh day is some eternal, unchanging thing or any of this pre-earth origin story that filters all of SDA theology. The Puritans and Reformers started with Scripture as the starting point, not the great controversy, which is then used to interpret all of Scripture. But then he cites Ezekiel 46.1, another passage they love. Doug, that verse shows the pattern of the command. Six working days followed by a Sabbath. It doesn't say Saturday. It doesn't say Sunday. He assumes his Roman calendar influence and imports that into the text, failing to see that what's in view is a pattern. And it was based on a memorial. This is also in the old creation. Christian Sabbatarians still follow that same pattern, Doug. The Memorial Day has simply shifted by virtue of Christ accomplishing what the old one was pointing to, such that now in the new creation, we are living in the substance of what the type pointed to, and the order is back to how it was pre-fall. We are back in right relationship with God. We begin our week in communion with him, and then go out and subdue the earth through our labors to God's glory the following six days. Repeat. If you recall from part one, they loved, Doug brought this up. The seventh day was around prior to the fall. Yeah, God's seventh day, not man's. <laughs> Man was fashioned and formed on preparation day, and his first day, based on evening to evening, was the seventh day. You guys missed this. It moved to the end of man's week after the fall, because man's rest also became cursed by the curse that was placed on creation. Christ comes and redeems and restores what man lost and puts us back in right relationship with God. And all of that stuff ultimately points to God's rest. We got into all that in part one. He said, what's the first day of the week called? A regular working day. Oh, really? Notice the Feast of Booths in Leviticus 23. The Feast of Booths was named that because it was instituted to remember the wilderness journey from Egypt to Canaan when then when God made them live in, in booths. And before we read this, remember, the Sabbath is rooted in rest, creation, and redemption. Those three things. And we see this unfolding in redemptive history leading to the incarnation and God himself coming who would restore the creation that fell, redeem it, which includes humanity since we are a part of that, and would then enter his rest, God's rest, after that work was completed. 
So with that in mind, notice Leviticus 23, 33 through 43. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, On the fifteenth day of the seven month, and for seven days is the feast of booths to the Lord. On the first day shall be a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. For seven days you shall present food offerings to the Lord. On the eighth day you shall hold a holy convocation and present a food offering to the Lord. It is a solemn assembly. You shall not do any ordinary work. These are the appointed feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim as times of holy convocation for presenting to the Lord food offerings, burnt offerings, and grain offerings, sacrifices, and drink offerings, each on its proper day. Besides the Lord's Sabbaths, and besides your gifts, and besides all your vow offerings, and besides all your free will offerings, which you give the Lord. On the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the produce of the land, you shall celebrate the feast of the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a solemn rest, and on the eighth day shall be a solemn rest. And you shall take on the first day the fruit of the splendid of splendid trees, branches of palm branches, and boughs of leaf trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. That's what they used to actually build their booths with. You shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year. It is a statute forever throughout your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All native Israelites shall dwell in booths, that your generations may know that I made the people of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Thus the reading of God's holy word. So the SDA church is wrong when they claim there were two laws, God's law and Moses' law. No, Moses was a mediator, a conduit messenger between God and the people. He was a picture of Christ, who is the better mediator than Moses. That's what Hebrews 3 is talking about. But it was all God's law. Nevertheless, Doug, there you go. The first day is said to not only be holy in some instances, but no ordinary work was to be done on the Feast of Booths, which occurred on the first day. Showing that the holiness aspect around any day is tied to obeying God, not some sort of ethereal divinity that a day of a week that the day of a week possesses. They'll dismiss this as simply being a festival, as if that negates the point. It doesn't. This is a type and shadow of the substance, which is Christ. The new covenant creation was anticipated in the Old Testament feast days by the eighth day Sabbath, which pointed figurative, figuratively to Christ. We got into that some last time. The new creation, by the way, was also anticipated by the Jubilee year, which was the year after the seventh seven. So again, eight. Christ declared himself to be the fulfillment of the Jubilee in Luke 4, uh, 419, which is why every Sunday is a is the day after the seventh, like a almost like a miniature Jubilee. But also notice, it says this festival is to be a statute forever. Yet SDAs love appealing to places like Ezekiel, which say the same thing about the Sabbath being forever, to try and bolster their position. Oh, it's going to be observed in heaven, brother. Isaiah 66. Yet they don't think the Feast of Booths will be observed in eternity. <laughs> and as you'll see in a moment, they don't, uh, they don't observe the festivals and ceremonial aspects and claim they were nailed to the cross. When no, the festivals are actually kept now by being in Jesus, who's the substance of them. That includes the Feast of Booths. No law was nailed to the cross. But I guess that would mean something that is said to be forever doesn't mean it will always have the same form it once had. In fact, to be consistent with their whole, the ceremonial law was nailed to the cross line, they would have to then recognize that something that is said to be forever can be done away with. Nevertheless, this is a perfect example that no, when the SDA church claims that God never called any other day holy, they are wrong. It's right there, Doug. Redemption out of slavery is exactly what the Feast of Booths is about. The first day, redemption. Egypt, Deuteronomy 5, the second giving of the law, the form of the fourth commandment changing. Are you getting all the connections, folks? No, no, no. They have no biblical, they have no biblical support. No, we're just not on spiritual milk all the time. You got to get past that, folks. You got to get past that. And this idea of the silly standard that they like to whip out 
Oh, where, show me one verse in the Bible that says, yeah, okay. That's not going to work out very well when you internally use that same standard because you're not supposed to use unjust weights and measures like the Proverbs say. Redemption out of slavery is exactly what the Feast of Booths is about. This is a foreshadowing of our redemption, which again is one of the three things that the Sabbath is rooted in, creation, redemption, and rest. The, the Israelites were to remember the true God of heaven and earth. That's creation. Remember their redemption that he ultimately led. That's redemption. And they were to rest in doing so. That's the rest. This took place on the first day. It's all right there, sir. You guys love typology, supposedly. There you go. The exodus out of slavery was typological of our bondage and slavery to sin, and Jesus as the better Joshua and Moses led us out in a better pro to a better promised land, the heavenly Mount Zion, the better rest by a better mediator, a better Joshua that led a better redemption. We've looked at Hebrews 3 and 4 before many times, which lays all that out. But it's this sort of hopscotching around the Bible in little sound bites that's Doug's problem. You don't actually look at the substance or theme of the narrative of Scripture and the bigger picture of what's going on. So you have to result to, to conspiracy theories and just ridiculous assertions to try and say we have no, remember last week, we have no rhyme or reason for what we do. We're just like a guard standing post that just inherited a tradition, and we have no idea why we're doing what we're doing. This is after he used the hasty generalization fallacy by saying he went to a couple pastors locally that couldn't give him an answer to the subject on the Sabbath. So therefore, Christians just have no basis. No, Doug, you just didn't look hard enough. Now he's going to go into full-blown historical revisionism mode. Buckle up. So if Sunday keeping isn't in the Bible, and I think I tried to establish that, where did it come from? Well, it comes from, just as the name implies, sun worship. Uh, for years in Rome, and they get it from the Babylonians, and it goes all the way back to Egypt. One of their principal gods was Ra, the god of the sun. And around the ancient world, they understood something miraculous happened with photosynthesis. When the days get longer, and when the sun shines, plants come out, life comes out, the other animals and herbivores do better, and all of a sudden everything springs into life by virtue of sun. They understood there's a mystery there. Photosynthesis is an amazing thing. We even get electricity from sunlight now, don't we? solar panels, right? So they, they knew there was power in the sun, but instead of worshiping the one that made the sun, they started worshiping the sun. And Moses said, do not lift up your eyes and worship the sun, the moon, and the stars like the heathen do. By the time of Christ in Rome, their sun worship was one of their principal gods, and um, what was gradually happening is as the church grew, eventually, by the time of Paul, there were soon more Gentiles believing in Christ than there were Jews. And pretty soon there are a lot more Gentiles in the church than Jews. And the Gentiles, wanting to reach their pagan friends, they said, let's make as many accommodations as we can to try to reach them. And so for a while, in Rome, they actually, they worshiped the day of the sun on the first day of the week. And um, many Christians they worshiped on the Sabbath. They said, you know, we'll get a lot more of them to join our church if we will also recognize Sunday. They thought they were being evangelistic. And it came in like a Trojan horse. The Jews were very unpopular. You realize that uh, 70 AD, the Romans destroyed Jerusalem for the rebellion. And uh, it was a very expensive war. You know, the Romans had to fight three years against Masada. And it was a very expensive war. The, the Romans were so tired of the Jews that when they finally conquered Jerusalem, they decimated the people. It was a terrible siege. The Christians, wanting to distance themselves from the Jews who had become very unpopular, and they thought they were legalistic, they said, well, we, we actually, we worship on the Lord's Day. And because Jesus rose on the first day of the week, and they started to manufacture theology that had no Bible basis at all. Let me go on and prove this to you. Matthew 15, verse 9, And in vain they worship me, teaching the doctrines of the commandments of men. Now, I've got to say something right here. Are there going to be a lot of people in heaven that went to church on Sunday? Yes. Millions. Millions and millions of Sunday-keeping Christians are going to be there because they did not know. Are there going to be people in heaven that own slaves? You don't want to say yes, but you know it's true. Otherwise, you just kicked Abraham out of heaven. <laughs> right? And David. And Jacob. 
Are there going to be people in heaven that had multiple wives at one time? Yes. God winks at the times of ignorance, but when we know the truth, we need to walk in the truth. So yes, there's, gonna, there's good, I believe there are spirit-filled, godly, Christian, heaven-bound people in many Sunday churches that maybe don't understand these things. Sin is knowing to do good and not doing it. The Bible says, if we continue in sin after we receive a knowledge of the truth, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26, there is no more sacrifice. And so it, when we understand and then we say, I'm going to do what tradition says instead of what the Word of God says, that's serious then. So we got the whole kitchen sink right there and he's going to keep going. But Doug, you most certainly did try to establish that Sunday keeping isn't in the Bible, but you didn't do so. You failed. You simply cited, like you always do, a smattering of classic SDA proof texts, made zero mention of the new creation, which is the central aspect of the entire discussion. You bore false witness about Christians, and now you go on to do more of that. You utilized an inconsistent hermeneutic where you regularly appealed to the verbatim fallacy that every doctrine has to be verbatim stated or it isn't present, even though your guys' entire system would collapse if you held that standard across the board for all of your own novel doctrines. So first, he made the ridiculous sun worship charge which has to be one of their most desperate attempts. Again, if Doug had held a consistent standard, you all are now Saturn worshipers, right? It's just silly that you guys still try this. But Christians, notice that ancient Christians dealt with this same silly charge in their day. Notice what Tertullian says in his book, To the Nations. Quote, Others, with greater regard to good manners, He's writing against uh, people that are coming up against Christians of the day. So he's uh, essentially uh, doing apologetics here. Quote, Others with great regard to good manners, it must be confessed, suppose that the Son is the God of the Christians, because it is a well-known fact that we pray toward the East or because we make Sunday a day of festivity. What then? Do you do less than this? Do not many among you with an affection of sometimes worshiping the heavenly bodies likewise move your lips in the direction of the sunrise? It is you at all events who have even admitted the sun into the calendar of the week and you have selected its day in preference to the preceding day as the most suitable in the week for either an entire abstinence from the bath or for its postponement until the evening or for taking a rest and for banqueting. By resorting to these customs, you deliberately deviate from your own religious rights to those of strangers. For the Jewish feasts on the Sabbath, the Jewish, yeah, for the Jewish feasts on the Sabbath and the purification, and the Jewish also are the ceremonies of the lamps and the fast of the unleav of unleavened bread, and the literal prayers, and all which institutions and practices are of course foreign from your gods. Wherefore, that I may return from this digression. You who approach us with the sun and Sunday should consider your proximity to us. We're not far off from your Saturn and your days of rest. Close quote. So regardless of your views regarding Tertullian, this is long before Constantine. This charge by Doug is not only silly, but old. And Tertullian's final sentence there is exactly the point. Now, he's, he's responding to pagans here, and he's trying to say, well, you, you pagans, uh, you almost look like not just us, but the Jews as well. <laughs> but you who claim we're worshiping the sun should consider the fact that by that same silly standard, you're worshiping Saturn. The, first, the, the, the Christian church worshiping on the first day has absolutely zip, zero, nada to do with photosynthesis and Babylonians having mystical views regarding the nature of the sun in the sky having some sort of powers. There are literally zero connections between the two. Nothing Doug said here has anything to do with why Christians corporately gather on the first day. He ironically talks about us being the ones who worship the sun when the reality is they worship a day by giving it a divine-like characteristic that the seventh day is literally eternal. Even though he just said earlier it was created. And days are a product of the sun and the moon. 
Notice here, Tertullian doesn't tie anything intrinsic to the day Sunday. He even talks about the pagans are the ones that named it that. I don't, we don't care what you call it. No, Doug, you guys worship the creation, not us. We meet on the day as a memorial of what occurred on that day, not because of some divine characteristic that the day supposedly has, and it's been with God eternally forever. Then he blamed early Gentile Christians and said that they were seeking to compromise and make accommodations for evangelistic reasons. Folks, what you what you have here, all of all of what he said, pretty much, total fiction. Total fiction. Story time with Doug Batchelor. Make believe. Has nothing to do with the new creation. The Gentiles wanting to seek to be evangelistic and that just kind of took over because they hated Jews. They love that excuse. Well, it's because they hated Jews. So now Satan in the great controversy was supposedly using early Gentile converts to mislead people by trying to be evangelistic and tell them they could worship the sun on Sunday as a Christian. And this then took off such that the entirety of the Christian church in both the East and the West adopted the practice. I mean, can we just apply Occam's razor here? <laughs> like, it can't be the obvious answer. It has to be this, like, no, no, no. It's this serious, crazy conspiracy. Even though we sent people like Samuel Bakioki to to try and, and find the, the proof for this, and we, we couldn't really find it earlier than, um, um, you know, what we attested, but ignore all that. Okay. If it hasn't become clear at this point that he has no clue what he's criticizing, I'm not sure what else will demonstrate it. He breezed over proof text while making assertions, misrepresented the position, utilized hasty generalization fallacy by claiming that since he went down to some pastors down the street who didn't have a strong understanding on the Sabbath and the role it plays in redemptive history, that means Christians as a whole have no basis. Now he's literally just parroting complete fiction to tack on to all of that. Notice he says the early Christians sought to distance themselves from the Jews because they were legalistic. When no, the fact is, they rejected Jesus. And we have no fellowship with anyone who does so. Anyone that denies Christ as King of Kings, Lord of Lords, God in the flesh, the Messiah, is Antichrist. Paul goes scorched earth in Galatians over Judaizers that were adding circumcision to the gospel. And to make sure he makes himself clear, he says he hopes that when they go to perform the action, their hand slips. The whole thing comes off. Let you use your imagination there. So if by legalistic, you mean they were heretical and distorted the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, leading to a false gospel that's cursed and can't save anyone, then sure. <laughs> but the reality is, many SDAs say this sort of stuff because they try and claim the Seventh-day Sabbath was abandoned because early Christians hated Jews. When no. Like Paul, they hated Judaizing which distorts the gospel. It's a rejection of Jesus, which is exactly what the SDA church has unknowingly done. And it produces a false, cursed gospel. The Judaizers in Galatia said, if you want to come to Christ, you have to be circumcised to do so. The SDA church says, if you want to come to Christ, you have to do so on the seventh day Sabbath. On top of a truckload of other additions they've added to the gospel that have nothing to do with the gospel. Jesus began the practice of corporate gathering on the first day with the apostles post his resurrection. We saw that in the last part. We have zero dated and documented cases of Jesus keeping the seventh day post his resurrection. What we do have are dated corporate gatherings all on the first day in the New Testament. The apostles then continued this practice after the 40 days and of, of Jesus ascending, after his 40 days in ascending which is also what Ignatius, a disciple of John the Apostle, tells us happened. So both history and scripture are against you on this, Doug. And you bore false witness again, by the way. He claimed our manufactured theology is not in the Bible. Not only is that ironic, considering your entire movement is built on a novel manufactured doctrine to cover up a disappointment in the 19th century, but you haven't even mentioned new creation a single time. It's totally manufactured. But I don't even know what your arguments are. 
You haven't even demonstrated that you know what we believe. Matthew 15 has nothing to do with the new creation being inaugurated and Jesus entering his rest on the first day. That's not talking about that. Again, Doug, you didn't use the HGM when you pulled up Matthew 15 there. You just brought up, I'm going to prove it to you. After you give this whole historical re revisionism, you then cite a single proof text and say, see, that proves it. It's, it's, it. The Bible says so. Laughable. Jesus restored what man tarnished in the garden where even the breast of man was cursed. But no, 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 no biblical basis. Just totally manufactured out of thin air. Doug, you guys are the last ones that should be talking about extra biblical manufactured theology. The entire great controversy worldview is extra biblical manufactured theology. The investigative judgment is entirely novel manufactured theology. Your guys' entire movement is built on man-made manufactured theology hidden behind the veneer of it's just the Bible. Judd Lake was talking about that in his book too, citing old people around S uh, uh, the pioneers days. And he's like citing these people and there's one quote in there, I remember who it's from, but this person was basically saying like, oh, it was Uriah Smith. He's giving an analogy that like if you were out on a ship and you were you had the you had the the guide, but then things became tumultuous and a storm came and and the the author of the book sent a, a pilot to you to tell you how to navigate through the storm. Are you going to reject the pilot basically saying that like Ellen White was given during these tumultuous end times to make clear the you know the path for the destination, etc. And he essentially says, if you reject her, it's just evidence that you don't actually believe the Bible. You don't believe the Bible in whole. If you do, you'll just accept her. Constant just, wow. Now, I responded a few weeks ago to Doug and the SDA church's claim that, of course, there'll be, there'll be a lot of, of Sunday keepers in heaven. Remember what they mean by this, Christians? <laughs> they always bring this up when doing this bearing false witness campaign on this subject. No, no, we believe lots of Sunday keepers will be in heaven, a.k.a. they were saved in ignorance before God gave them light through Ellen White to share with the world, which if you hear and reject, you'll be lost. That's what they mean by that. You can go watch that video for more on that. It's titled Doug Batchelor Butchers the Bible. No, Doug, those of us that have studied this out deeply understand just fine. <laughs> we aren't in ignorance. This idea that everyone was in the dark on the Sabbath until you guys came along is laughable. Theologians for 2,000 years have been discussing this and have known about your guys' claims because they're not unique to you on this subject. Judaizers have been around for a long time. Adventism's, Adventism's claim to novelty is the investigative judgment, not the seven-day Sabbath. You guys just resurrected a bunch of ancient heresy. No pun intended. <laughs> and you were talking about kicking people out of heaven like Abraham. Sir, you guys kick Ignatius, Justin Martyr, Tertullian, Cyprian, Eusebius, and hordes of, of gifts that God gave the church out of heaven. Because they weren't ignorant on this subject. <laughs> so you can't use that excuse. Because they understood what you call the Sabbath truth. And they rejected it because they understood scripture and the new creation. But then we got the butchering of Hebrews 10. Again, this guy does this. He just shotguns out verses and it's like, oh, wow, look, he's citing all sorts of the Bible. And because they're just citing it, Judd Lake talks about that in his book as well. Merlin Burt went through and looked at how many times she cites the Bible in Patriarchs and Prophets and Prophets and Kings. Who cares? That's not exposition. Who gives a rip? All sorts of people just cite the Bible. That doesn't mean anything. So just like that, you just did the same thing. And that's what Doug does all the time. He just cites verses. And oh, because he cites so many verses. Wow, it's so biblical. Hebrews 10. That this verse somehow supports if you hear about the SDA Sabbath truth and reject it, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins for you. That's essentially how he's applying this here. Doug, if you guys consistently applied this verse this way, then everyone would be lost. Because the author says there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins after having received a knowledge of the truth. Since you guys ignore the context, which is about Jewish converts being tempted to go back to the old covenant sacrificial system in this particular chapter, the whole book is addressing them wanting to go back to the old types and shadows. But here he's specifically talking about those tempted to go back to the sacrificial system. But because you ignore that, you turn the verse into basically saying that if anyone has sinned since knowing something was wrong, they're doomed. 
Yet that isn't what's being said. Ironically, it's referring to Judaizing. Because <laughs> the author has already explained earlier in chapter 10 and in previous chapters that Jesus is the final sacrifice. He was writing to Hebrew Christians prior to, uh, to 70 AD because the temple was apparently still standing to be able to go back and do those things. So he's pointing out how Jesus is better than all of the shadows. And again, in this pericope, he's specifically dealing with how Jesus is the better sacrifice, the final sacrifice. And to go back to the animal sacrifices is to trample underfoot the blood of the Son of God, who is that final sacrifice. And that's why there remains no, there, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. They can't go and sacrifice animals anymore. There is no more of that. <laughs> the author is exhorting people to cling to Christ and not return to shadows. Nothing to do with supposedly hearing, in this case, the Adventist Sabbath truth, and if you reject it, you'll be lost. It just assumes you guys are correct. It doesn't demonstrate it. If Doug utilized the only approved hermeneutic of the SDA church, the HGM, he would understand this. But hopscotch exegesis allows you to make this text say whatever you want, and all sorts of people do. But also, Doug, the law had entire categories for unintentional sins. <laughs> you guys have created your own standard of what sin God does and doesn't hold people accountable for. <laughs> it isn't disobedience to worship corporately on the first day, Christian. That's the core issue. Adventists think Christians are in disobedience in this area, and we aren't. Once, that's, once that is, is extinguished, this whole idea completely collapses. And it isn't that the majority of people are ignorant and God's just winking at their sin and ignorance as they cling to a tradition. The earliest recognition of the observance of Sunday, it's a constitution of Constantine in 321 AD, enacting that all the courts of justice and inhabitants and towns and the workshops were to rest on Sunday. Here's the decree of Constantine. On the venerable day of the sun, is that S-O-N like son of God? Or is it S-U-N, like sun in the sky? It's the sun. See, Constantine knew the Romans still were involved in sun worship. First day of the week, that's where it gets its name. You know where Monday gets its name? Munde, in Spanish, lunes, right? Which is, l that's where you get lunatic. It's true. The people thought with full moon, people went crazy. And um, the different days of the week were named after the different Greco-Roman gods and somewhere a Viking god got in there Thursday was Thor's day but uh, Wednesday was Odin's day Friday was Frida, Saturday Saturn and so they were named after the different heavenly gods and the pagan gods so he says on the venerable day of the sun let the magistrates and the people residing in the cities rest let all the workshops be closed it was to be a Sabbath they did give permission for the farmers to milk their goats and do their farm work on Sunday. The church made a sacred day of Sunday largely because it was the weekly festival of the sun for it was a definite Christian policy to take over the pagan festivals endeared to the people by tradition and to give them a Christian significance. Arthur Wiggle, Paganism in our Christianity. The author of this is not a member of my church. He's just writing history. Another example of that, they started to allow idolatry because they said, look, the pagans all love their idols. They got their idols of Venus and a uh, uh, um, uh, what, what is it called? Athena, um, Mercury, Apollos, Jupiter. And uh, so they just said Mary, Peter, James, John. And, and they, they gave them all Christian names. They said, well, we'll it'll make it easier for them to transition. We want to make it easy. So they compromised to try and make it easy for them to join the church. And they started to, pretty soon they gave up the Bible Sabbath. And the church leaders say, we will feast on Sunday. Made it very attractive to the pagans to come in, but we will fast on the Sabbath. Now, after a while of fasting on the seventh day, feasting on the first day, which day would you enjoy? You can see that over time the Sabbath became very unpopular because first of all they said it was the, it's the Jewish Sabbath and, and then they started to uh, say, oh, we feast on Sunday and gradually it was abandoned. By the 5th century, Sozomen stated that most churches such as Constantinople met both on Sabbath, the first day, and Saturday evening. 
uh, but that in Rome and Alexandria meant only on the first day, Saturday evening, and no longer on the Sabbath. So you start tracking the history and the, the church fathers say that there was a gradual transition had nothing to do with the teachings of Jesus or the apostles. It is a man-made tradition that God's people have drifted from the commandments of God. But in the last days we should be returning. Doug, you are full of it and you have no clue what you're talking about. Like I said in the first part, my challenge still stands. I don't think you'll take me up on it. I challenge you to a debate on this, sir. Bring your Bible. I'll bring my Bible. I'll come all the way out to California. I'll come on your territory in Granite Bay. Let's do it at your church. See you back this claim up, buddy. Again, we got more of the whole kitchen sink here. So we've seen and addressed this claim before, Constantine. So if you've been watching for a while, you should know how Doug twisted both the Encyclopedia Britannica as well as their favorite source to cite, Philip Schaff's History of the Christian Church. Folks that have been here for a while, are those ringing a bell? You remember when we've looked at those before? Because they all parrot these same sources, but haven't actually read what they're citing from, clearly. First, let's look at Shop's book. Again, I have this book. We're going to look at the exact same chapter that Doug cited from and see what Dr. Shop is saying. Notice. Quote, The observance of Sunday originated in the time of the apostles and ever since forms the basis of public worship with its ennobling, sanctifying, and cheering influences in all Christian lands. Pause. From the time of when? The apostles. Not Sylvester the Pope, not Constantine, not the Council of Laodicea, the apostles. He continues. The Christian Sabbath, Lord's Day, First Day, etc., is on the one hand, the continuation and the regeneration of the Jewish Sabbath based upon God's resting from the creation and upon the fourth commandment of the Decalogue, which, as to its substance, is not of merely national application, like the ceremonial and civil law, but of universal import and perpetual validity for mankind. It is, on the other hand, a new creation of the gospel, a memorial of the resurrection of Christ, and of the work of redemption completed and divinely sealed thereby. Adventists will point to that and say, See, Schaff said it was a memorial of the resurrection of Christ. Yeah, it's not what you think he means. It's talking about new creation. It rests, we may say, upon the threefold basis of the original creation, the Jewish legislation, and the Christian redemption and is rooted in the physical, the moral, and the religious wants of our nature. It has a legal and an evangelical aspect. Like the law in general, the institution of the Christian Sabbath is a wholesome restraint upon the people and a schoolmaster to lead them to Christ. But it is also strictly evangelical. It was originally made for the benefit of man, like the family, with which it goes back beyond the fall to the paradise of innocence as the second institution of God on earth. It was a delight to the pious of the old dispensation, and now, under the new, it is fraught with the glorious memories and blessings of Christ's resurrection and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That's really what Schaff is getting at when he talks about the memorial. Again, it's all tied in redemption, the new creation. The Christian Sabbath is the ancient Sabbath baptized with fire and the Holy Ghost regenerated, spiritualized, and glorified. It is the connecting link of creation and redemption, of paradise lost and paradise regained, and a pledge and preparation for the saints' everlasting rest in heaven. Close quote. All things that I've said before, but said a lot more scholarly. Christian Sabbath is rooted in the new creation, not the old. The seventh day, Seventh-day Sabbath was the memorial of the old fallen creation that needed to be redeemed. It pointed to the new creation and eternal rest. Jesus Christ accomplished redemption upon his resurrection. With the new memorial pointing to that, 
which then also points us to the eternal rest. Schaff continues. In this matter, as in others, the ascension or the accession of Constantine marks the beginning of a new era, and it did good service to the church and to the cause of public order and morality. Constantine, get this folks, Constantine is the founder, in part at least, of the civil observance of Sunday, by which alone the religious observance of it in the church could be made universal and could be properly secured. Oh, shoot. Sorry, folks. I just realized that uh, I was on the wrong slide there. Sorry about that. In the year 321, he issued a law prohibiting manual labor in the cities and all judicial transactions at a later period, also militarily exercises or military exercises on Sunday. He exempted the liberation of slaves, which was an act of Christian humanity and charity might with special propriety take place on that day. Close quote. So there was a civil and religious aspect, two different things. The civil had to do with the legalities around what the government did and did not recognize. That was not the religious aspect which the church was already practicing. This civil observance had to do with the empire recognizing Christianity as a valid and legal religion. This was an action taken by Constantine to protect Christians, not commingle or co opt paganism with Christianity. Which is why Schaff then says, But the Sunday law of Constantine must not be overrated. He enjoined the observance, or rather, forbade the public desecration of Sunday. Not under the name of Sabbathum or Dies Domini, but under its old astrological and heathen title, Dies Solus, familiar to all his subjects, so that the law was as applicable to the worshippers of Hercules, Apollos, and Mithras as to Christians. There is no reference whatsoever in his law either to the fourth commandment or to the resurrection of Christ. Besides, he expressly exempted the, the country districts where paganism still prevailed from the prohibition of labor and thus avoided every appearance of injustice. Christians and pagans had been accustomed to festival feasts. Now get this. Constantine made these rests to synchronize and gave the preference to Sunday on which day Christians, from the beginning, celebrated the resurrection of their Lord and Savior. This and no more was implied in the infa or in the famous enactment of 321. Close quote. Ah, so the Sunday law of Constantine cannot be overrated. His law legalized Christianity and forbade the public desecration of Sunday. And from the beginning, Christians were celebrating the memorial of the new creation, the day Christ accomplished his redemptive work and entered his rest the first day. Doug, if you actually read Schaff and the chapter from where you cited, you'd know that you just abused what Schaff is saying because he explicitly says to not do what you just claimed. <laughs> Evidencing you haven't even read what you're citing from. This particularly irks me because day in and day out, I get to hear from SDAs, you don't know where you're citing from. <laughs> the irony, the irony. You made zero distinction, Doug, between civil and ceremonial. Constantine did not enact a religious or ceremonial law. It was civil. Yes, that matters. <laughs> because Doug tries taking the civil enactment and then conflates it with the religious practice. The religious practice was already happening before Constantine. The same Schaff tells you it originated with the apostles. And Ignatius's historical account tells us John, which, let's see, a disciple of one of the apostles or somebody 19 generations removed, whose, whose testimony is going to be more accurate and more reliable regarding what the apostles were practicing and doing. That also then jives with the New Testament and all of the dated cases that we have of when Jesus corporately gathered with the body. And Ignatius tells us they were doing this because Jesus started this with them. And then it's dated and documented for us in scripture. And it's, those are the only ones that are dated and documented. 
There's no grand conspiracy. You guys have to find that though. So you have to just pull from over here and just throw the whole kitchen sink out there and make these wild, lazy assertions that are just laughable in, in, in the 21st century. Doug even recognized that this was long before Constantine. <laughs> Less than five minutes ago, he claimed Gentiles were trying to distinguish themselves from Jews, and it was based on man-made manufactured theology, supposedly. Yet now, it's because of Constantine and the sun gods, supposedly. Well, it started with them there, and then they were trying to be evangel evangelistic, and then well, with Constantine, it really ramped up. And Doug, you made the same error your pioneer J.H. Wagner did, of whom I'm going to guess you borrowed this from, just like Mark Finley did, and it backfires. From his book titled The Origin and Growth of Sunday Observance in the Christian Church, first look at what he admits, and then watch how he twists what's actually being said by Dr. Schaff, just like Doug did, citing the exact same thing. First, he says, Dr. Schaff is justly esteemed as a man of extensive learning and whose testimony regarding facts no one would call into question. He is a theologian and a warm friend of Sunday keeping. But, the, but his theological relations have not prevented his giving the facts into the first Sunday law. Close quote. Schaff said the, the first day started with who? The apostles. No one could call into question Schaff's extensive learning and testimony regarding the facts in this area. Okay. The same man here that we're going to see that worshiping Sunday originated with the apostles, Schaff did, and who said that Constantine's edict cannot be overrated and used to weasel in all these extra conspiracies, that it was to protect Christians, it wasn't a melding of paganism with Christianity. This, this guy here is now going to quote Schaff's book, just like Doug did. Notice what he says. He says, so now he's quoting from Schaff here. He enjoined the observance or rather forbade the public desecration of Sunday. Oh, what do you know? This is what we just read, right? Not under the name of Sabbathum or Dies Domini, but under its own astro or yeah, own, under its own astrological or heathen title, Dies Solus, familiar to all his subjects, so that the law was as applicable to the worshipers of Hercules, Apollo, or Mithras as to the Christians. Close quote. That's where he ends it. And indeed, it was more applicable to the worshipers of Hercules, Apollo, or Mithras than to Christians, for it referred to heathen and not at all to Christian worship. Is that why Schaff was, was citing the pagan names and, and why Constantine synchronized things the way that he did? He continues, again, Dr. Schaff says, he enjoined the civil observance of Sunday, though not as Dies Domini, but as Dies Solus, in conformity to his worship of Apollo, and in company with an ordinance for the regular consultation of the Heraspex 321. Concerning its claim to be considered a sacred day, it's not necessary to add much to what has already been said by the writers quoted. It would be presumption in the extreme to claim that God ever conferred any blessing or sanctification directly upon it. By a system of false reasoning, they try to make out that the blessing that was conferred upon the seventh day was transferred to the first. But of course, no scripture is ever quoted to justify the claim. The authorities here given say that it was dedicated to the Son, and that dedication is its only claim to sanctity. Close quote. So now that we buried that guy, because you can see he's straight up lying or doesn't know what he's talking about, baloney, just like Doug, this guy has no clue what he's criticizing. And if he actually read Schaff, he would have seen the Christian Sabbath has nothing to do with the transference of Saturday to Sunday or, instit or, or uh, an institution of a religious observance of Sunday. The same guy he assured us couldn't be questioned when it came to the facts of history regarding the subject. He would have seen what we read 
and that he explicitly said Constantine can't be overplayed like the SDA church has done. His edict had everything to do with Christians and protecting them, not the heathen. It wasn't about dedicating the day to the sun. Wagner is twisting Schaff's words to say the exact opposite of what he was saying, just like Doug did. The name simply had to do with the astrological calendar, not because of the pagans, not because of worshiping the sun or melding Christianity with paganism. And it had no, as, as Schaff rightly pointed out, it had nothing to do with transference of anything from one day to another, the Ten Commandments, etc. They both partially quoted Schaff out of context, only the portions that make it appear like Schaff is agreeing with his, his, their contortions, when in reality, that isn't at all what Schaff is saying. Now let's look at the Encyclopedia Britannica regarding the Edict of Milan, since he cited that also. By he, I mean Doug. Notice, perfectly in line with Dr. Schaff. Quote, Edict of Milan, proclamation that permanently established religious toleration for Christianity within the Roman Empire. It was the outcome of a political agreement concluded in Medellin, oh, how do you ever, however you say that, modern Milan, between the Roman emperors Constantine I and Licinius in February 313. The proclamation made for the East by Licinus in June thir uh, 313 granted all persons freedom to worship whatever deity they pleased, assured Christians of legal rights, including the right to organize churches, and directed the prompt return of Christians of comp and directed the prompt return to Christians of confiscated property. Previous edicts of toleration had been as short-lived as the regimes that sanctioned them, but this time the edict effectively established religious toleration. The extant copies of the decree are those posted by Licinus in the eastern parts of the empire. Close quote. It established religious toleration. That was the heart of it. Which is a sheer case of divine irony because one of the other big boogeymen that the SDA church loves to claim is that there's a war on this exact thing and their freedom to worship on Saturday is under attack. This is precisely what the Edict of Milan secured for Christians. It was legal protection from religious persecution. So Constantine enacted a law that legally recognized Christianity alongside the pagan religions of the day. He makes no reference to the Ten Commandments, changing the Fourth Commandment, worshiping the sun, etc. Because the Edict had nothing to do with that. The two groups, pagans and Christians, weren't even united. The pagan Romans didn't have weekly festivals. <laughs> Their festivals were annual, like a holiday. But the Christian day was weekly, every Sunday. And like Schaff said, Constantine made these synchronize by giving the preference to Sunday, the Christian day. It was a civil action on his part, and the civil law required pagans to respect the day Christians were worshiping. The point being, it had nothing to do with intermingling sun worship with pagans into Christianity. As for him citing Arthur Weigel, Doug, Arthur Weigel was an Egyptologist not a church historian or theologian, and he was wrong. The Jehovah's Witnesses Watchtower also cites that same guy. Just Google him. The Jehovah's Witnesses Watchtower also cite that same guy in some of their materials to try and support the rejection of the Trinity as being pagan because <laughs> he's an Egyptologist. So nice try, but no, he was wrong. It had nothing to do with taking over pagan festivals to give them the uh, Christian significance. He mentioned the church fathers. My, the irony. Doug, you have zero business citing the church fathers on this subject. Not a single one of them. Oh, the church fathers were all saying that it just was... <laughs> no, dude, if you'd read the church fathers, like you'd read any of these other sources, no, <laughs> you wouldn't be saying what you're saying tonight. You'd have a, a different critique. Because they all understood the Sabbath. They weren't in ignorance. And I know you guys love to claim because Ellen White did that everyone before the light on the Sabbath truth was revealed, they were resting in peace because they didn't have the light. No, you're wrong. They all understood the Jewish Sabbath. Yes, that's what it is. The old creation Sabbath. And they rejected it because Jesus inaugurated the new creation. And as we saw in part one, no, Christians didn't eventually reject what the SDA church calls the Bible Sabbath. They love to attach the word Bible Christians to the, the, front, the, the front of things. 
to make it appear and sound like it's just, oh, it's just the, the, the biblical teaching. And they just believe what the Bible does and no one else does. <laughs> but no, early Christians did not adopt Sunday because it was a feast day over and against Saturday being a fast day. And they liked feasting more than they did fasting. <laughs> like what a spin. What a spin. Yeah, they had all sorts of fast days, Doug. It wasn't just, it's just, again, th these sorts of breezing, drive-by sort of smatterings and claims. It it's just like you get the shotgun gish gallop of so much stuff. And then you think, oh, well, he cited a ton of the Bible. Oh, wow, he cited these historical sources. Dude, you have no clue what you're talking about. This has been one long chain of historical revisionism, misrepresentation, and fiction. The church fathers, like, it's like I'm still thinking about this. The church fathers do not agree with you that this development happened like you said. You Like you grazed over a number of details that some of the fathers highlight like Saturday being a fast day, but then you weave into that your fictional narrative that you're spinning to make it look like they agree with you when they don't. And then you bore false witness yet again, claiming it's a man-made tradition that has nothing to do with the teachings of God. This coming from the guy that doesn't even understand what he's criticizing. Still waiting for that mention, just a mention of it, of new creation. Yet you're going to try and cite the church fathers, the irony. Here's some quotes just from church history. This is the Catholic Encyclopedia, Volume 4. The church, after changing the day of rest from the Jewish Sabbath or the seventh day of the week to the first, made the third commandment refer to Sunday as the day to be kept holy as the Lord's Day. Now, I took this picture. This is a picture, a granite copy of the Ten Commandments in front of a Catholic church here in Sacramento. If you look real close, you'll see a picture of me in my t-shirt taking a picture reflected this is, and I zoomed in a little bit. I want you to notice something here. They don't have the second commandment. The second commandment they make, don't take the name of the Lord your vein. That's supposed to be the third commandment. They delete the commandment about idolatry. It's totally not there. They take the fourth commandment and they make it the third commandment. And then in order to keep ten commandments, they then take the tenth commandment and they divide it. They, instead of thou shalt not covet, they say don't covet your neighbor's wife and don't covet your neighbor's house. And they should make a 13th commandment. Don't covet your neighbor's donkey too. They should have made a third one out of that, but they tried to maintain the number 10. It says the beast power would think to change times and laws. And they certainly did that. Wow. All right, folks, buckle up. So now it's because of Romanism. First, it was Gentiles taking over, not liking Jews, but they wanted to evangelize more easily, so they adopted pagan practices. Then it was Constantine's Edict of Milan. Now it's because of Roman Catholicism and the Pope, supposedly. Doug, you are a dishonest person. Did you notice what was cut off, folks, from the picture? The first commandment. Let's bring this back a, a titch. Look at the photo. Look what's at the top of the top left. Second commandment. Huh, I wonder why Doug cut the first commandment off. First, when the Roman church, Doug, says the church changed the Sabbath, they mean the apostles. They think the apostles were the first Roman Catholics. And they mean that Jesus instituted the first day with the disciples and the apostles continued this practice, handing it down to us. This is what the likes of Ignatius and others were talking about regarding new creation that you have yet to even mention. The arguments that Protestants have, or have had, and still have, with Rome over the subject are in the vein of apostolic succession and what it means to go back to the apostles. Because both sides agree this practice worship on the first day, is apostolic in nature by virtue of Jesus beginning it with his apostles. We agree with Rome on how, uh, uh, or we disagree with Rome on how Protestants are connected back to the apostles. But the point being, you cite the Catholic encyclopedia as if it helps your case or proves your point. It doesn't. You guys read into these quotes, like you just did, to try and support that the papacy, hundreds of years after the apostles, changed the Sabbath like Daniel predicted, and so on. Reading all of your great controversy narrative into the quote, when that's not what at all is being said. Now, Doug, I have this Catholic encyclopedia. So I referenced it when I saw you cite it. 
What I found was that you or your assistant, whoever made this presentation, did a quote mine and didn't look at where you were citing from, or you wouldn't have gone on to say what you did regarding the removal of the commandments. Either that, or like I said, you're a dishonest person, which I'm beginning to think you are based on the way you snapped that photo. Because folks, you know what the New Catholic Encyclopedia Volume 4 says in the literal next sentence of what he cited? Notice what sentence he omitted. So he read everything that's not highlighted. The church, on the other hand, after changing the day of rest from the Jewish Sabbath or seventh day of the week to the first, made the third commandment refer to Sunday as the day to be kept holy as the Lord's day. This is the sentence. The Council of Trent, with the reference there, condemns those who deny that the Ten Commandments are binding on Christians. Hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. Does it say eight? Does it say nine? No, all ten. This is in the section of the encyclopedia talking about the Ten Commandments. Why'd you leave out that last sentence, Doug? Oh, no, no, no. See, it's the Ten Commandments of uh, of uh, they, the two they removed, and then they broke up the other ones to make it ten. It's only talking about those. Well, Doug, it gets worse for you. Because look what's on the very next page from the quote that you cited. The next paragraph, literally the next paragraph. Quote, there is no numerical division of the commandments in the books of Moses, but the injunctions are distinctly tenfold and are found almost identical in both sources. The order, too, is the same except for the final prohibitions pronounced against uh, concupiscence. That of Deuteronomy being adopted in preference to Exodus. A confusion, however, exists in the numbering, which is due to a difference of opinion concerning the initial precept on divine worship. The system of numeration found in Catholic Bibles is based on the Hebrew text and was made by St. Augustine in the 5th century in his book of Questions on, of, of Exodus. And, and was adopted by the Council of Trent. It is followed also by the German Lutherans, except those of the school of, the school of Martin Bucer. This arrangement makes the first commandment relate to false worship and the worship of false gods as to a single subject and a single class of sins to be guarded against. The reference to idols being regarded as mere application of the precept to adore but one God and the prohibition as directed against the particular offense of idolatry alone. According to this manner of reckoning, the injunction forbidding the use of the Lord's name in vain comes second in order, and the decimal number is safeguarded by making a division of the final precept on concupiscence, the ninth pointing to sins of the flesh, and the tenth to the desire for unlawful possession of goods. Close quote. Ah, so the Roman Catholic Church teaches the binding validity of the Ten Commandments, all ten of them. And the reason they enjoin the first and second and spread out the tenth is due to the Hebrew text not having numeric division. But all ten are there. Yes, including the second. It's enjoined to the first commandment. Doug, this is called the Augustinian order. Nothing nefarious. I guess you guys love to appeal to Luther and his angst for the papacy like Walter Weith was doing a couple weeks ago. I guess Lutherans are now the beast power that changed times and laws too because they used the Augustinian order also. <laughs> the text does not give an inspired numbering, which is why there have been various number numberings throughout history because there's actually 13 imperatives, not only 10. And to speak on this and to show that this has been a long-standing understanding, notice what Origen says in his homilies in Exodus. Third century, quote, the first commandment, therefore, is you shall not have other gods beside me. And after this follows, you shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of anything which is in heaven above or in the earth beneath or in the waters under the earth. You shall neither adore nor worship them, for I am the Lord your God, a jealous God who avenges the sins of the fathers on the sons of the third and fourth generation for those who hate me and show mercy to thousands for those who love me and who keep my commandments. Some think that all these words together are one commandment. 
But if it be thus supposed, the number 10 of the commandments will not be completed, and where now will be the truth of the Decalogue? But if it be divided in that manner in which we also separated it in the preceding reading, the whole number of Ten Commandments will appear. The first commandment, therefore, is, You shall not have other gods beside me. The second is, You shall not make for yourself an idol nor any, uh, nor any likeness, etc. Close quote. So Origen explains there are some that believe the words of what we call the second commandment are enjoined to what we call the first. This is way back in the third century and it has to do with the Hebrew language. But regardless of the numbering, the substance of both is still present in Rome's teaching and Bible translation. So Doug is misinformed on this, and is more than likely just regurgitating what he's heard repeated in SDA circles. Especially considering that in the literal next paragraph of the book you cited from, the next sentence in the quote that you gave, they state that they not only believe all ten are binding, but also the reasons for enjoining the first and second and distinguishing the tenth. Which is evidence you didn't actually get this quote from the book yourself. You got it from one of these seventh-day propaganda sites. And yes, I'm aware that many Puritans also made this claim that Doug did, and guess what? They were wrong! <laughs> and I like many of them. I just cited Thomas Watson a few weeks ago, his book The Ten Commandments. And he makes this claim in there. And I don't know what access to information he had in his day, but nevertheless, he was wrong. The Roman church still affirms the second commandment. You might disagree with their interpretation and application of it. I know I do. <laughs> but that isn't the same as saying that they have removed it to allow for idolatry. And this is evidence that Daniel was prophesying about the papacy who would change the Ten Commandments. Very deceptive and dishonest, sir. And as for the Tenth Commandment, uh, yeah, Doug, because coveting your neighbor's wife is not the same as coveting your neighbor's donkey. <laughs> a wife is not a possession. There's a distinction there. That's all that's going on. That's why they make the distinction. Lutherans do the same. And a catechism is a teaching tool. They're seeking to teach children that a human is not a possession. It's really not that complicated. But yet again, this guy has no clue what he is criticizing. And you don't have to be a Roman Catholic to understand this and represent people accurately. And it's sad that saying such is going to lead to SDA's calling, which, what else is new? It's going to lead to them calling me a Roman Catholic, a Mary worshiper, whatever. When no, some of us actually do care about the other commandments, namely the ninth. And we're sick of hearing you guys rally cry that you're the commandment keepers. While you misrepresent and slander and lie about other people. Furthermore, here's the Catholic Church's Bible translation, the Douay Reims, of Exodus 20, 2 through 5. I am the Lord thy God, who brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt not have strange gods before me. Thou shalt not make, make to thyself a graven image, nor the likeness of anything that is in heaven above or in the earth beneath, nor of those things that are in the waters under the earth. Thou shalt not adore them, nor serve them. I am the Lord thy God, mighty, jealous, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. <laughs> so they supposedly removed it from their catechism, but included in their Bible translation? Yeah, it makes total sense. This is bad argumentation, folks. Do not use these arguments, please, when engaging with Roman Catholics. It will set up any seasoned Roman Catholic apologist to jump off the top rope and flying elbow that level of apologetic through the ring and bury it. Avenist, when you say this, Roman Catholics immediately are going to dismiss anything else that you have to say because they're going to know you didn't even bother to learn what they actually believe. It would be the equivalent of when someone says, Ellen White originated all of SDA teaching. Adventists will immediately just dismiss anything else. Someone has to say, because they know she didn't originate any of the teaching, but supposedly received vision confirming the beliefs that they say were arrived at through deep biblical study. That's the belief and claim. Or it'd be the same as when people try to come against SDS. You believe Jesus is an angel because you think he's Michael the archangel when they're going to say, no, we believe Michael is an uncreated, not angelic being, but a title of, of Christ. So it'd be the same thing as when somebody shouts that out 
and you guys just immediately shut down and say, well, you don't even know what you're criticizing. I'm going to ignore everything else you say. That's what Roman Catholics are going to do when you say this level of nonsense, because that's what it is. So the point being, don't use this silly argument that Rome, that, that Rome removed some of the Ten Commandments. Just please don't do that. And they should make a 13th commandment. Don't cover your neighbor's donkey too. They should have made a third one out of that, but they tried to maintain the number 10. It says the beast power would think to change times and laws. And they certainly did that. What do Sunday churches say about this problem? Now friends, stay with me. I'm going to do some reading here. I, I'm going to just read quotes from other churches, scholars, official statements, so you know, they know that something is wrong. Baptist from the Baptist Manual, there is no scriptural evidence of the change of the Sabbath institution from the seventh to the first day of the week. That's pretty clear, amen? No scriptural evidence. Another Baptist commentary, this is called The Lord's Day in Our Day by William uh, Owen Carver. There was never any formal or authoritative change from the Jewish seventh day Sabbath to the Christian first day observance. It's not there. Uh, Alexander Campbell, one of the leaders in the Church of Christ, I do not believe the Lord's Day was changed from the seventh day to the first day. Catholic. This is from the book Cardinal James Gibbons, Faith of Our Fathers. You may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. You'll not find a single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday. The Catholic Church for over a thousand years before the existence of a Protestant, by virtue of her own divine mission, changed the day from Saturday to Sunday. They freely admit that they were there. The holy, uh, the holy day, the Sabbath, was changed from Saturday to Sunday, the day of the Lord, not based on scriptural authority, but from the church's sense of its own power. Catch the rest of this. People who think the scriptures should be their sole authority should logically become Seventh-day Adventists and keep Saturday holy. Amen. Well, they admit it. I appreciate that. Catholic Services Appeal 1995 from uh, Catholic, St. Catherine Catholic Church, St. Clair Boulevard. Uh, you got one from the Anglican Church. And where are we told in the scriptures that we're to keep the first day at all? We're commanded to keep the seventh day. But we are nowhere commanded to keep the first day. The reason why we keep the first day of the week holy instead of the seventh is because the church has enjoined it. They say it's something that church fathers did. But they have no right to change the law of God. Is, did God say, I'll bless whatever day you pick? Or did he say, you keep my day? And he told us what his day is. It's the Sabbath of the Lord. Is there any command, Episcopal writes, is there any command in the New Testament to change the day of the week of rest from Saturday to Sunday? None. That's their manual of Christian doctrine. Methodist. Harris Franklin Rawl, he's a Methodist theologian, take the matter of Sunday. There is no passage telling Christians to keep the day. Doug, you are literally just parroting quotes from this site. One second, folks. Simply citing individuals like this as though it's a universal agreed upon thing is ridiculous. Look at this, folks. You can find all the ones that he, that he cited from here. B the generic Baptist church manual. There's William Owen Carver's. The Lord's Day and Our Day. You can go to all the ones. You went to Church of Christ. That's under here. You can go to Catholic. They love all these same ones that they just parrot and recycle. You've been talking for almost 45 minutes at this point, and you haven't even one time mentioned the new creation. You didn't cite Hebrews 4, 1 through 11. You completely missed why Acts 20, verse 7 Matthew 28, 1, etc. are even cited. You just breezed over them asking an irrelevant question of where do these verses give us a new commandment when that isn't why they're cited. There's supplemental support for the fact that the church was doing the substance of everything we do today on the first day. Now you pair a bunch of quotes SDAs regularly circulate and all pair it. And based on your track record thus far with Schaff, the Catholic Encyclopedia, etc., I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, you or your assistant didn't read any of these sources either. You simply grabbed from the bag of quotes that you've latched onto for, decade, for decades and recycled. For example, just go and type in William Owen Carver, The Lord's Day in Our Day, page 49, 
And look at how many of the sites I just showed you pop up, all parroting the same quotes. And part of the evidence that they clearly didn't read it for themselves, all of them, is the fact that they all left off the letter S. They cite the book wrong, and then they all borrow it. Because the book title is The Lord's Day in Our Days, plural. But again, Christian, Adventists love doing this gish gallop on this topic. They'll just throw these quote mind quotes out there and think that it's just like, ha ha, see, even Protestants know there's a problem. Doug, you said you were citing scholars to try and make the quotes hit harder. W.O. Carver was a professor of missions at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. His Baptist manual is not a Baptist confession. It was an individual document he put together. Alexander Campbell wasn't even a Christian, but a restorationist that claims the church completely fell away and he was a part of restoring it. You cited the Catholic Mirror, another Catholic source you guys love to use and abuse, which is talking about what I mentioned earlier, the claim to Protestants having no connection back to the apostles, supposedly. And since the apostles instituted such practice in the church by continuing what Jesus started with them, Protestants then have no basis for the practice. That's the context of the discussion, apostolic succession. It's not them admitting what you guys claim about the papacy and Daniel saying that the Pope would change times and laws and all the other great great controversy junk that you've read into it. Then he cited their absolute favorite one, the 1995 Catholic Services Appeal. That says if one holds to the sole authority of the Bible, they should be an SDA. They love this quote, as you heard the people in the crowd. Which is another example of their cherry picking. They like Rome when it favors them. Otherwise, it's all papal deception and lies. (laughs) He cites an Anglican and demonstrates he doesn't even know what's being said. That quote isn't referring to the church fathers, Doug. By the church, they mean the apostles. The apostles. Not the church fathers. And Protestants, which Anglicans are a part of, and Catholics agree on that. They argue if Protestants do actually go back to the apostles, and if so, how? So then Rome says, if we don't, we have no basis for the first day because it ultimately goes back to Jesus instituting it with the apostles, not the church fathers. What if we did this with SDAs, and that was our argument? Look at this SDA over here and over there. They'd get in a tizzy so fast. (laughs) He very obviously went into one of these, or his assistant, whoever, clearly went into one of these Seventh-day Sabbatarian sites and just mined the quotes without actually examining the document themselves. Because so far, Doug hasn't even engaged with the argument. He's just claimed it has no rhyme or reason, and then he's knocked down a bunch of straw men, citing other people who, who, who could have not been aware of the history or arguments themselves to then use them as a representative of the whole, which is a hasty generalization, not an argument. What is Apostle Paul saying in Romans 14? I hear people, whenever they learn the Sabbath truth, they say, well, wait a second now. We don't really need to keep any day. And they go right to two verses, Romans 14, Colossians 2. We're going to look at them real quick because we're not afraid of any of these verses. Romans 14, verse 5 and 6, Paul says, One person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each one be fully convinced in his own, ma- in his own uh, mind. So you want to keep Sunday? You keep Sunday. I'll keep Saturday. You know, I've never heard a Sunday pastor stand up and tell his congregation, you keep whatever day you want to keep. They don't ever say, you want to go Sabbath? It's fine. Uh, they, well, there might be some. But uh, there are actually some Sunday churches having services on two days a week now because the more of them are learning that, more of their members are asking questions because they're watching Amazing Facts programs. <laughs> I know one pastor that told me, you're causing me a lot of problems. <laughs> but um, this is simply saying, they're talking about the Jewish ceremonial laws, that if you want to keep Passover, the, the Jews that were very scrupulous about keeping their annual feast, he said, look, if you want to keep that day, keep it to the Lord, but don't make other people keep it. I tell Christians that. Some people say, are we supposed to celebrate Christmas? I said, look, if you want to remember the gift of God, giving a son, that's up to you. Don't tell someone else they have to. There's no scripture command about it. If you're going to do it, don't do it for elves and Santa Claus. Do it for Jesus coming into the world. So there's, you know, it's up to you what you want to do. That's how I would use that. 
would God ever say concerning the Sabbath? I realized I had a man stoned to death for breaking the Sabbath in the Old Testament, but if you want to keep it, it's up to you. Is that the same God? No. It's one of God's commandments. Sin is the transgression of the law. He who observes the day, observes it to the Lord. He who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. So what is meant in Colossians 2 verse 14 through 16? Now we're going to look at that real quick. Let me read it to you. Notice now, you can look it up in your Bible. I want you to follow these words carefully because someone's going to ask you about this. Having wiped out the handwriting of ordinances. Notice it's handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Notice the word against us which was contrary to us and he took it out of the way having nailed it to the cross having disarmed principalities and powers he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them in it. Now what is he talking about when he says having abolished the handwriting and the ordinances? Look in 2 Chronicles 33 verse 8 that you take heed to do all that I have commanded them according to the whole law and the statues and the ordinances by the hand of Moses. You got two laws friends. You got the Ten Commandments and the ordinances given by Moses. Ten Commandments, hand of God, ordinances, handwriting of Moses. Notice that distinction. Paul in Colossians is talking about the ordinances. Deuteronomy 4.13 So he declared to you his covenant that he commanded you to perform even the Ten Commandments, that's clear right? And he wrote them on two tables of stone and in addition to that the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and judgments that you might observe them, those are the ordinances in the land that you cross over to possess. They're written by a man's hand on paper. 2 Kings 21.8 Only if they are careful to do all that I have commanded them and according to all the law that my servant Moses commanded them. You got the Ten Commandments and the Law of Moses. Two separate distinct laws. God kept them separate. You got the Ark of the Covenant. What's inside the Ark? Ten Commandments. But what about the ordinances? Take this book of the law, put it in the side of the Ark, there's a pocket on the outside of the covenant of the Lord your God that it might be there as a witness against thee. He says blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that were against us. So what's nailed to the cross? The Ten Commandments? or the ceremonial Sabbaths that you find in the Bible. Colossians 2, 16 and 17, notice, so let no one judge you in food or drink or regarding a festival or new moon or Sabbaths, small less, plural. Sabbaths, now he tells you what kind of Sabbaths, Sabbaths which are a shadow of things to come but the substances of Christ. There were certain Sabbaths that came after sin, they were annual feasts that were shadows foretelling the coming of Christ they were nailed to the cross. The handwriting of Moses. Not the Sabbath that was part of creation. The Bible says in heaven we're going to keep that one. From one Sabbath to another all flesh will come and worship before the Lord. It's the annual Sabbath that Paul is talking about. And you know I just went through for my own edification last night I looked up these verses. I went through all of the Protestant scholars. Matthew Henry, Adam Clark, John Gill, um, James's Foss and Brown Spurgeon, you can look at them all. They all understand the Sabbaths that were nailed to the cross were ceremonial Sabbaths. It's only recently that theologians are saying that one of the commandments was nailed to the cross. None of the Protestant Puritan fathers believe that. And so um, it's just a heresy that's come in. Huh, the irony. So Romans 14. Notice Paul doesn't state what you guys do in Romans 14 regarding anything about the Sabbath being a seal. Why do I bring this up? Well, if that were the case, the Sabbath were the seal. It would be very odd that Paul would say what he did and not make sure to clarify that. I talked about this in my very first YouTube video as one of the reasons why I left Adventism. Sabbath seal is a myth. They want to talk about just believing the Bible and utilizing the verbatim fallacy. How's about where the Bible verbatim says the Sabbath is the seal, Doug? We'll wait. <laughs> They're going to comment Exodus and Ezekiel. says it was a sign. You know what verbatim means? But then Colossians 2. So we're going to camp out here for a second. No, Doug, Colossians 2 doesn't say any law was nailed to the cross. 
You guys rely on the King James rendering of the phrase handwriting of ordinances to then try and equate that with the book of the law in Deuteronomy 31 and elsewhere. We've addressed this in a video from a number of months ago, using Doug Batchelor as the example. The book of the law contained all of the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, which means it contained the Ten Commandments twice. You can go look up the video. Two laws, question mark, Moses' law and God's law. So as you heard him say, they say the Ten Commandments are God's and the rest was Moses's. Except, no, it's all God's, and he used Moses as a mediator to relay it. Doug, you think the Israelites breaking the Ten Commandments didn't stand against them? Only ceremonial laws? If you go to Deuteronomy 31 where he cites at the beginning when, when Moses is talking to Aaron, or Joshua, sorry, and he gives him the book of the law, the command is to teach your children to obey all these things. Oh, so the children weren't taught to obey the Ten Commandments. We go through so many verses. We go through Second Chronicles like he did. We go all over the place. The book of the law contained the Ten Commandments twice. The book on the outside of the ark, Doug, contained the Ten Commandments in both Exodus and Deuteronomy. It wasn't a book of just ceremonial functions. You would know this, Doug, if you didn't just hopscotch around the Bible and actually looked at entire passages and worked through them verse by verse. But secondly, the Greek word used in Colossians 2 for handwriting of ordinances or certificate of debt, if you use a different translation, is kerographon. It's a legal term. And this is the only place in Scripture that it's used, which is why, like any hopox legomena, there's all theologians like the Lord's Day, Kyriake Himera, like we looked at last week. There's a lot of, of focus and, and time that theologians put into a hopox is simply a single usage of the word in a body of, of text. Well, this is one of them. This is the only place this word occurs. Doug wants to try and say by the SDA church, because that's what they say, is that it's talking about the handwriting of Moses and that's what was nailed. No, it's not. You did word association fallacy. See, it says ordinances over here, and so it says handwriting of ordinances over here. It's talking about the Mosaic law that stood against them. That's what was done away with. No, it's not talking about any law being nailed to the cross. This word is a legal term, and it has to do with debt that a person has incurred. And Jesus himself equates sin with debt in the Lord's Prayer, if you compare Matthew and Luke. In one, he says, forgive us our debts. The other, he says, forgive us our sins. Paul is saying that Jesus paid the debt that believers had incurred by their sin, which, yes, was for violating even the moral law. Because, again, it's not in focus of canceling out a, a type of law. He then, Jesus then bore the sin of those people in his body on the cross, and he was then nailed to it, canceling the debt by paying it in full. And that is then why he goes on to say, let no one judge you in a festival, new moon, Sabbaths, etc. It is not talking about ceremonial laws being nailed to the cross, but ultimately fulfilled in the person and work of Christ, the substance. I mean, think about it. So God disarmed rulers and principalities. Colossians 2, that's what it goes on to say. God apparently disarmed rulers and principalities by nailing Israel, Israelite ceremonial laws to the cross. Doesn't even make sense in the flow of what Paul is saying. He's talking about Jesus, who is the substance of the shadow of things to come. G, kind of like we've been talking about last week and this week. And he removed the barrier between man and God by paying the debt they owed in full, reconciling them to God, like he says in Romans 5. Because this set of verses is actually said in the context, if you start back in chapter 1-2, of union with Christ. Where in verse 11, he mentions that those who are in him that phrase I constantly point to, have been inwardly circumcised by virtue of being in Christ. And so he says to not let anyone take you captive by empty philosophy and deceit, which many people proof text to apply to any sort of philosophy, but he's actually talking about Judaizers, who seek to bind people to old typological shadows and customs, like the SDA church, and for believers to not let these individuals deceive you. Because by virtue of being in Christ, you as a believer already have the substance of those types and shadows, such as circumcision, the feast days, etc. 
Furthermore, you guys put yourself in a pickle when you claim this by talking about ceremonial laws being nailed to the cross because, Doug, the Day of Atonement was a part of ceremonial law. As is seen in the same chapter you just had up on the screen, Leviticus 23. And yet you guys think the Day of Atonement began 1,800 some odd years after the cross and it wasn't nailed to it, even though it was a part of ceremonial law. <laughs> also, all ceremonial law was not nailed to the cross because baptism, the Lord's Supper, gathering for corporate worship, etc., those are all ceremonial laws. Laws being they are commanded. And they are ceremonial in nature. But this is specifically referring to believers not being taken captive and led astray by Jewish ordinances that were a type and shadow because we already have the substance, which is Christ. But then Leviticus 23 and annual Sabbaths. Doug, you just said earlier there was no evidence of the first day being anything other than a normal working day, yet you cite Leviticus 23, which talks about the first day, regardless of what day it fell on, was to be a holy convocation with no ordinary work to be done on it. Yet you didn't bring any of those up on your, your slide. You only looked at the Feast of Trumpets, which we saw that one last week when we looked at the, the sample calendar. When it fell on the, the first day, etc. This would move around based on the Jewish calendar. The point being, it was the pattern. Not some sort of ontological divinity that a 24-hour rotation around the sun has. But Doug, it's funny you mention Matthew Henry, Adam Clark, John Gill, Spurgeon. To say they all agreed, this is referring to festival Sabbaths, they all agreed on the binding validity of the weekly Sabbath. Yes, and they all fundamentally disagreed with you on virtually every aspect of what that means. Because they all understood new creation, something you still have yet to mention. So he cited Methodist theologian Adam Clark, who I know Doug loves because I've heard him cite Clark a number of times. And SDAs love to say, we're firmly in the Methodist tradition. Well, what does Clark mean by the Sabbath being a perpetually binding ordinance, Doug? You say this as if all the commenters that you said support your guys' position. Notice. Adam Clark, commentary on Colossians 2.16. Quote, There is no intimation here that the Sabbath was done away, or that its moral use was superseded by the introduction of Christianity. I have shown elsewhere that, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, is a command of perpetual obligation and can never be superseded but by the final termination of time. As it is a type of that rest which remains for the people of God, of an eternity of bliss, it must continue in full force till that eternity arrives, for no type ever ceases till the antitype become. Besides, it is not clear that the apostles refer to all of the Sabbath in this place, whether Jewish or Christian. His of Sabbaths, and that's the Greek for the phrase of Sabbaths there, or weeks, most probably refers to their feasts of weeks, of which much has been said in the notes on the Pentateuch. Close quote. So for all the SDAs that like to appeal to their church being staunchly in the Methodist tradition, there you go. One of the foremost Methodist theologians. And what does he recognize? There was a Jewish Sabbath and a Christian Sabbath. Exactly what I've been saying, and Christians have been for, saying for nearly 2,000 years. Which Doug actually disregarded earlier on in this presentation by saying Christians later started calling it the seventh day, or started calling the seventh day the Jewish Sabbath out of spite for Jews. But two, Clark rightly recognizes that the Christian Sabbath is a type of the ultimate rest which remains for the people of God in eternity, and the Christian Sabbath will be in full force until when? Until we enter eternity. Not that in eternity there will be days with moon and sun cycles, such that, that, that time will be like it is kept now. Doug tried weaseling that in, citing Isaiah 66, 23, like they always do, to say, see, see, the seventh-day Sabbath will continue into eternity. Even though it says from new moon to new moon, and they don't keep the new moons. And Revelation says there will be no moon in eternity which is the evidence that something else is going on in Isaiah that they miss. But Clark rightly recognizes that the Christian Sabbath, just like the, the Jewish Sabbath, both were typological of the eternal rest of heaven. Not that the Christian or Jewish Sabbath will be observed every seven days in eternity. He's, he's essentially reiterating what we've shown on this platform multiple times from Hebrews. Hebrews 4, 1 through 11. 
Same thing John Owen was saying. Same thing you, you'll find Spurgeon saying, who he mentioned. Same thing you'll find countless commentators s- s- stating. He cited John Gill. Doug, John Gill was a Reformed Baptist affirming the 1689 London Baptist Confession. It is the cousin confession of the Westminster Confession of Faith, which is what I hold to, and is 95% identical to it. He affirmed the Christian Sabbath. Notice what he says in his Colossians commentary. Quote, speaking of the phrase, or of the Sabbath days, or Sabbaths, meaning the Jubilee Sabbath, which was one year in 50, and the Sabbath of the land, which was one year in seven, and the seventh day Sabbath, and some copies read in the, the singular number, or of the Sabbath. Doug likes to always mention that too. Oh, it says Sabbaths, plural. That means it always has to be referring to, no, not necessarily. It's a lot more complicated than that, dude. I'm going to skip back here because notice what he's saying. I know that there's a lot of semicolons and stuff here. But he says, speaking of the phrase, of the, uh, 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 of the Sabbath days, or Sabbaths, meaning the Jubilee Sabbath, the Sabbath of the land, and the Seventh-day Sabbath, and some copies of manuscripts read in the singular number or of the Sabbath, which were all peculiar to the Jews, were never binding on the Gentiles, and to which believers in Christ, be they who they will, are by no means obligated, nor ought they to observe them. The one any more than the other, and they should be imposed upon them, they ought to reject them. And should they be judged, censured, and and condemned for doing so, they ought not to mind it. Whoops. He goes on in his commentary. But you get the point. Gill didn't agree that the Jewish Sabbath aspect was included in what was removed at Calvary, Doug? Question mark. Does that sound like someone that agrees with the SDA church's position? <laughs> Not at all. Yes, Gill believed the substance of the fourth commandment to be perpetually binding, which is what the command is actually about. The day is a part of the form, the ceremonial form of the command, and the form can change. Yet the substance of the command is still the same. God is due a portion of his image bearer's time to step away from taking dominion and subduing the earth, i.e. working to focus on him, worship him, give thanks, rest and recover, etc. I know I say it a lot, but the SDA church infuses this sort of like divine characteristic into Saturday, making the day itself the substance of the command as though days are eternal. When no, they're a part of creation. Which shows they worship creation, not us. They've elevated a part of creation to a divine status. Doug just got done claiming earlier that early Christians erroneously ascribed a distinction between the Christian and Jewish Sabbath, yet Adam Clark, a Methodist, and John Gill, a Reformed Baptist, both recognized that same distinction as well. Gill recognized that the fourth commandment was still binding, but not the same ceremonial form in the Christian era, meaning the seventh day. That was Jewish. None of the people that Doug cited agree with the SDA church's Judaizing, making the Sabbath the seal, that Saturdays will be observed in heaven like they do now, and all the other great controversy details they claim you know, about the Sabbath. So don't try and cite them to ride their coattails to bolster your guys' twisting. The only general aspect they would agree with you on is that the fourth commandment is still binding, but not in the way you guys claim, and not for the same reasons. They all agreed with the Christian Sabbath position that I'm putting forth not the Jewish position that you're putting forth, which isn't even really the Jewish position. It's your own tradition. Does Revelation say God's people will be keeping his commandments in the last days? Why am I preaching this? Because before Jesus comes, there's got to be a revival. Three angels' message is calling people to return to the Creator, right? Worship him who made. That means if you're going to remember the Creator, remember the day he set aside for that. Revelation 12, 17, the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to me war with the remnant of her seed that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Blessed are they that do his commandments that they might have a right to the tree of God and they may enter in through the gates of the city. And again, it says Hebrews 5, 9, 
and being made perfect he became the eternal author the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him you know all over North America there's train tracks we have train tracks you ever heard the train go by while we're doing the service right here train tracks right out there you know how wide they are they are four feet eight and a half inches all across North America they've got to have train tracks the same size or the trains don't fit the tracks do you know why they're four feet eight and a half inches because when we made our trains in America they used the same jigs and machinery they use for the wagons so why are the wagons in America why were they axle length four feet eight and one half inches because when the people came over from England that was the size of their wagons they used the same machinery the same measurements that were on their wagons some of them were shipped over and so they all made them the same length why were all of the wagons in England that length because all of the wagons in Europe were that length why were all of the wagons in Europe four feet eight and a half inches because they found if they did not make them four feet eight and a half inches long the wheels did not fit in the stone ruts on the main roads in Europe and it would break them off because they were always fighting the ruts in the road and it broke off the wheels so they had to make them four feet eight and a half inches it's really a bad length for a train you would like to have wider wheels on a train they wouldn't tip over near as often going around a turn too fast didn't we just lose a train you heard about it in uh, England or no in uh, Washington why were the ruts that size because the Romans built the roads and the Roman chariots were four feet eight and one half inches the chariot wheels do you know why the Roman chariot wheels were that wide <laughs> because that's how wide they needed to be to accommodate the rear end of two chariot horses so the trains all over North America have been governed by the rear end <laughs> of two horses it's interesting how you get stuck on something that's hard to change but if you should try to change them now you realize you go to China and Japan there are bullet trains you know why they're ahead of us on bullet trains because they don't follow the Roman chariot size and they were able to get to it faster than us so God wants us to continue obeying Jesus said Matthew 7 21 not everyone that says unto me Lord Lord will enter into the kingdom of heaven but he that does the will so it's one thing to say oh I know that that's very interesting Pastor Doug but are you going to be a hearer of the word or a doer of the word what is the will of God I delight to do your will oh my God your law is within my heart when the law of God love for your neighbor first four commandments is love for God last six commandments are love for your fellow man the law is summed up in love and though if we love him Jesus said why do you call me Lord Lord and do not the things I say he said if you love me do what keep my commandments he doesn't want us to just be hearers of the word he invites us come unto me all you who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest so we got more of the classic hopscotch exegesis find verses that use the word commandment or talk about obedience and just hitch the SDA wagon to it <laughs> like John 14 15 which we just addressed on Monday last Monday which if you saw or you've studied that pregnancy, you know that the Ten Commandments aren't in focus. And recognizing such doesn't mean you're just, you're, you're, it doesn't say anything what a person believes about the Ten Commandments. That's irrelevant to the fact that that's not what's in focus there. It is an insight into this faulty hermeneutic method that they utilize. But the irony of him citing this, <laughs> while he has a false image and depiction of what's supposed to be Jesus on the screen while he says it, but just as long as you don't bow down to those like the pagan Roman Catholics, right, Doug? <laughs> if you're a former Adventist, I encourage you one of the my biggest piece of pieces of advice. Well, besides finding a sound, solid Bible believing local church and and being accountable, <laughs> not this idea of being like a rogue Christian. But outside of that, Learn to get past the spiritual milk style of interpretation that the SDA church uses and oftentimes leaves people with. Where you just cite a verse as if it supports you by virtue of just citing it or thinking that everything taught in scripture is just done so by these little single proof texts. 
where you just ramble on and on and on and on and make a bunch of assertions and then inserted text here or there. This is why Paul talks about spiritual milk and spiritual meat. Not all doctrine is spiritual meat or, or milk. I guess both. But at the beginning of this presentation, he talked about the story of the, of, of the Trojan horse. We didn't look at that portion because it's just five minutes of him basically doing the same thing, using these stories, which he's going to go on another one here in a moment, just like he did with the guard. And he always uses them to, to like, piously, but, but look like the humble Christian guy, misrepresent and slander Christians. Because that's what he did there. He goes on about tracks, and he always inserts these amazing facts. And like, ha, 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 and just this, you know. And really, it's, it's but that's what Christians are doing. It's just because, see, they're just following this tradition. They don't really know what they're, they're actually believing. That's what's going on. Rambles for five minutes. Claims Sunday was a, a Trojan horse weasel into the church. That's what he says in the first five minutes. But, Doug, you guys are the king of tro Trojan horsing stuff into scripture. Like you just did. You guys will cite a verse that uses the word judgment and try and cram in 1844 investigative judgment exclusively for professing believers and so on. And there's always this underlying jab that SDAs are the ones obeying Christ and everyone else isn't, <clears throat> which assumes their understanding of the fourth commandment is correct. No, we don't concede that. <laughs> I don't concede that. Nor did the majority of Christians in Christian history. You claim Christians are in disobedience to God by going to church on Sunday. We aren't. There's always the undertone, too, that Christians are against obedience, that SDAs are just about obedience and everyone else is theological anarchists with a wild, wild west understanding of Christianity. Yet, no, we're against your unlawful wielding of the law and your prophetess's claim that obedience maintains, retains a person's righteous standing before God as if obedience can be added to the perfect work of Jesus Christ. He just assumes their position on Revelation, which, if that's wrong, the whole thing collapses. Assuming that Revelation 17 and 22 are about some special end times remnant group completely cutting off the vast majority of Christian history, let alone the original audience John penned the Revelation to. But we also get insight into how, in the SDA mind, there is no concept of the law-gospel distinction. Doug thinks obedience to the law is what is going to open the gates of heaven to someone. Yet they have no concept that the law requires absolute perfection. You're already disqualified. Not breaking it who knows how many times he has, and then confessing it to Jesus to then have a clean slate again on a gradual path. <laughs> nope, doesn't work that way. Doug, you have to have a perfect righteousness, having never violated the law a single time. And that's not given to you in small spurts by Jesus as if it's like a drip feed. And as long as you, you remain doing your part, the drip feed will essentially get you there. You need something imputed to you in full such that when a person stands before God, they're seen as though they lived the life Christ did and measured up to the standard, even though they didn't. In their system, you could have small bits of Jesus' righteousness imparted, not imputed, to you, but it wouldn't be enough because you didn't arrive at the final status ne needed, which is total perfection. You don't get numerous do-overs because of Jesus' help. Doug bore false witness in this presentation multiple times, violating the Ninth Commandment, which Scripture says if you violate one, you violated the whole thing. You are deceiving yourself if you think that going to church on Saturday is going to cut it. He cited Matthew 7 and the false teachers and prophets that Jesus turns away. Sir, that will be countless SDAs who say, but, but, I kept the Sabbath. I was a part of the remnant church. I had the three angels' messages. I followed the health message. I gave tithe, and so on. You guys are not the commandment-keeping church. You guys worship an idol, a false god. The heavenly trio, which isn't even actually real. Three gods that are one in a mission and purpose, with the Father alone being the Almighty. It's like a tritheistic monarchian hybrid concept. You guys make images of what you believe to be a person of the Godhead. Violating the second commandment, like you just did. <laughs> but like these, 
at your own universities. This is from Walla Walla University Church and Campus. The one on the left, front and center, on stage, you have an image of Christ that all worship that, that everyone worships in front of. Oh no, but we're not bowing down. Yeah, okay. Then a statue on campus of Jesus among us. You guys violate the second commandment constantly. And you know what the response is going to be? That isn't what the second commandment is teaching. Ah, so you disagree with some person's interpretation of one of the commandments. Isn't that rich? What if we just said, nope, you hate God's law. You just don't believe the Bible. We have an inspired in interpretation. So if you disagree, you just, you hate God's law. That's what Adventists do when you disagree with their false understanding of the fourth commandment. You platform and bind the consciences of millions of people to submit to a woman who bore the name of God falsely countless times. She claimed to be speaking on behalf of God and wasn't. Demonstrably so. You guys don't keep the Sabbath, the substance of which is entering into Jesus Christ by faith in the gospel. The, mem the Memorial Day means nothing if you haven't done that. It doesn't mean a dang thing. It doesn't mean you guys keep the Sabbath just because you go to church on a certain day. You first have to enter into Christ by faith, the true Christ, by believing the true gospel, not the Adventist Christ and the cursed Adventist gospel. You guys are just like the wilderness wanderers that the author of Hebrews is warning about. They were doing the external commands. They were keeping a day. They didn't enter. They perished. They died. You guys don't keep the sixth commandment. And when I say you guys, I'm talking about the corporate organization here. I'm talking about the commandment keeping church. You don't keep the sixth commandment. Your movement sanctions the murder of unborn children as one of the leading providers in your own state of California, Doug. And your, your movement makes all sorts of profit off of such practice. You guys violate the ninth commandment constantly, as you yourself demonstrated in this presentation multiple times. It's hard-coded into your guys' beliefs, as you demonstrated by parroting many of your pioneers' false claims about others such as Protestants and Roman Catholics. You guys are kidding yourselves if you think you are a bastion of commandment keeping. No, what you mean is you go to church on Saturday, so you think you're the apple of God's eye when you're not. He hates false gospels, which is why he says anyone spreading one is under his curse and is damned. I admire many SDA zeal to seek to obey God. I really do. Despite what they may claim about me, I don't take umbrage with every single jot and tittle of Adventism. But the cart is before the horse on this one. I don't know. Maybe the cart is four foot, eight inches or whatever. Maybe that's the problem. <laughs> but either way, you guys think trying your best is going to somehow supplement what Jesus accomplished such that your obedience and faith put you in God's good graces. Adventists will argue this tooth and nail, whatever. People can check the sources for themselves. You conclude. Their inspired prophetess clearly claims you maintain your righteous standing before God, which is what they define justification as, by your obedience. Okay. <laughs> no, no, it's not obedience to the gospel like Paul mentions in 1 Thessalonians or the author of Hebrews mentions in Hebrews 4. No, no, no. Again, they do not understand the law-gospel distinction. They do not understand the proper use of the law adding a fourth use. Again, former Adventists, you're going to know that they, they try and do, well, there's a, a tripartite division between moral, ceremonial, and civil, and then there's also three uses. Folks, they got that from other people. They didn't originate that. And they twist it because then they add on a fourth use of the law, which is what completely botches the whole thing, that single addition. Obedience does not maintain a person standing before God. It is the fruit of being in Christ where a person is accepted, adopted, forgiven, redeemed, justified, holy, blameless, and everything else scripture has to say about those who are in union with Christ. Their seeking to obey is a result of already having all of that, and they recognize that even on their best day, we still don't measure up. That our obedience cannot be tacked on to what Jesus accomplished already, and it's strictly and solely by him and his perfect work that we are kept secure and seen as righteous before God. 
So no, Doug, we're not against the law. We're against your guys' unlawful wielding of it, which creates a false gospel because you guys don't understand the law gospel distinction and you intermingle the two, which results in a false gospel. And he wants you to have that rest. I want to read something to you. I thought that was very interesting in conclusion here. Take my yoke upon me. You will find rest for your souls. Sabbath is all about enjoying that rest. Have you ever heard the poem of the crooked calf path? One day through a primal wood, a calf walked home as good calves should, but made a trail all bent askew, a crooked trail as all calves do. Since then three hundred years have fled, and I assume the calf is dead, but still he left behind his trail, and herein lies my zany tale. The trail was taken the very next day by a lone dog that passed that way, and then a wise bellwether sheep pursued the trail over vale and steep, and drew the flock behind him too, as good bellwethers always do. And from that day o'er hill and glade through those old woods a path was made, and many men wound in and out, and dodged and turned and bent about and uttered words of righteous wrath because it was such a crooked path. But still they followed, do not laugh, the first migrations of the calf. And through this winding wood they stalked because he wobbled when he walked. The forest path became a lane that bent and turned and turned again. This crooked lane became a road where many a poor horse with his load toiled on beneath the burning sun and traveled three miles in one. And thus a century and a half they trod the footsteps of that calf. The years passed on in swiftness, swiftness fleet. The road then became a village street. And this before men were aware, it became a city's crowded thoroughfare. And soon the central street was this of renowned metropolis. And men two centuries and a half trod in the footsteps of the calf. Each day a hundred thousand rout followed that zigzag calf about, or this crooked journey went the traffic of a continent. A hundred thousand men were led by one calf near three centuries dead. They followed still his crooked way and lose one hundred years a day. <laughs> For thus such reverence is lent to well-established precedent. A moral lesson here this might teach why I ordained or called to preach. For men are prone to go at blind along the calf paths of the mind and work away from sun to sun to do what other men have done. They follow on the beaten track and out and in and forth and back and still their devious course pursue to keep the path that others do. They keep the path a sacred groove along which all their lives they move and how the wise old wood gods laugh who saw the first primeval calf. You get that? Just, it starts with a, a calf meandering through the woods and then followed by a dog and then the sheep and then a man because it's a little easier going down a beaten trail and then pretty soon everybody's winding along and they're paving this weaving road. And maybe that's what's happened to the church, is people are following a tradition of men and not the commandments of God. What does the Lord want us to do? Oh, but Lord, I might be different. Well, Jesus said, you follow me, you're going to be different. But how could all the churches be wrong? Well, that's what they said about the religious leaders in Christ's time. If he's the Messiah, why doesn't everyone else believe in him? If you're going to be a Bible Christian, you need to follow the Bible, follow the Word of God. So is Sunday sacred? No, it's just another working day. There's only one day in the Bible God is blessed. That's the seventh day Sabbath. Amen? You want to be a, a doer of the word and not just a hearer, friends. Amen? Right, Doug. And when God blessed that day, it was man's first day, as we looked at in part one. It was not man's seventh day. It was God's. And man began his week in holy communion with God. But then sin broke that fellowship, which is in part why Jesus came to redeem what man broke and restore it. But after all of that, all Doug has is a silly poem that has absolutely nothing to do with Christians meandering a path that some aimless individual started and then everyone followed with no precedent.
That isn't an argument, Doug. It's just classic SDA piety or, or piety veiled in a cute delivery, which misrepresents those you're seeking to apply it to. And then adding in the soft emotional music, you didn't refute anything in your presentation. You engaged in a bunch of hopscotch exegesis. You bounced all over the Bible, making a bunch of assertions, misrepresentations, and bearing false witness. You didn't mention new creation a single time, whether in detail or even in passing. It's the central hinge of the discussion, and you're not even aware of that basic fact. You didn't steel man the position that you were then going to critique because you don't even know it. This was a, a standard prepackaged Sabbath talk from the SDA message mill that, as a former Adventist, we've heard parroted 500 times. All the same sources, all the same quotes, all the same proof texts. He said, that's what happened to the church. People are following the commandments of men instead of the commandments of God. That's rich. <laughs> Considering Seventh-day Adventism is a tradition, with your own novel concepts and doctrines and culture and your own arbitrary standards of what it even means to keep the Sabbath, your own novel God concept of the heavenly trio, whether clean meats are or aren't allowed, whether tea and coffee are actually sinful, whether dress reform is still needed and upheld, or, uh, still needs to be upheld or not, and on and on and on. You guys live in one big tradition that developed in the northeastern peninsula of the United States in the 19th century. Because the fact is, everyone has tradition. And tradition isn't a bad thing. How one utilizes that history is what matters. Just because it's not inspired doesn't mean it's useless. But it's as we saw, it's obvious why you guys want to dismiss it, though. Because <laughs> it's not on your side whatsoever. You have to utilize conspiracy and hasty generalization to try and bolster why all of history is foreign to your claims. But more importantly... Not a single thing that Doug presented refutes why the Christian church worships corporately on the first day. None of it. Just citing a verse, Adventist, just citing a verse and assuming your position and understanding of the text is not an argument. Doug didn't exegete a single thing in this whole, yet, yet SDAs will point to something like that and go, see, he really knows his Bible. Look how much Bible he's citing. No, you just assume your understanding of the text and make a bunch of assertions. That's called begging the question. They think their position is obvious, which is why Doug said stuff like, they're hiding their eyes. Uh, no, the irony. That's the exact problem you all have. You're not seeing the bigger picture. You're locked into your, your preset great controversy programming and worldview such that you can't see anything outside of it. And then you wonder why everyone else is not seeing at all what you guys are claiming. They don't all necessarily have the same reasons for why they arrive, why we all arrive at the same conclusion, but we all disagree with you. Just use Occam's razor. It's not this grand conspiracy to where you have to completely rewrite all of history and come up with these elaborate... No, it's just the obvious answer. You guys are wrong. Everyone else was not wrong until you guys came along to correct everyone. I know it feels good to feel part of a club, like you have a special insight into things that no one else has. Gnost Gnosticism is not new. <laughs> but then it's because of the great controversy that you wonder why everyone else isn't seeing the same thing that you've contrived up with your wild theories and conspiracies and all sorts of other missing links. That's the problem. Not Christians hating God's law, not Christians hiding their eyes, not the Pope, not Roman Catholics, not Constantine, not tradition, not the Church Fathers, not the Council of Laodicea, not former Adventists. It is your extra-biblical, great controversy worldview that we supposedly have to have, according to Herb Douglas, to even be able to understand the Bible. Recall the series of claims from the whole talk, y'all. If you saw both parts. He started the first five minutes talking about the history of what being a, a, a Trojan horse means, which set the stage to claim the first day Sabbath is a Trojan horse that brought with it all sorts of other deceptive doctrines. He then quoted Genesis 2, didn't catch it, that it wasn't man's seventh day, it was God's. It was man's first day based on evening to evening. Then third, he claimed the Lord's day had to be Saturday because John was working in the coal mines in, on Patmos, but, re but refused to, to work on the seventh day Sabbath, which is when the revelation vision was given to him. This after he utilized the verbatim fallacy for Christians 
saying we have to have a single verse that verbatim says Sunday is the new Sabbath. Then he talked about the calendar changing, but that it didn't actually change the weekly cycle. Again, irrelevant to the Christian Sabbath position, that isn't the claim here. Then he talked about a story of a guard standing post who had no clue why he was doing what he was doing to try and say that's a picture of Christians bearing false witness. By that same standard, I can point to individual Adventists that don't know why they do what they do. Yet people like Doug would say, well, the answers are out there. They may just not have been taught well, which is precisely the point. So stop lying about Christians. Then he used hasty generalization fallacy to say he went and talked with a couple local pastors down the street. And because they didn't have a strong theology around the subject, that means Christians as a whole have no basis for why they do what they do. (laughs) Didn't even bother to consult theologians. I I mean, shoot, he cited He cited John Gill and Spurgeon for Colossians 2.16. Read the same individuals, Doug, on the Sabbath. Clearly, he didn't read John Gill's uh, commentary specifically. I I, I haven't read Adam Clark's enough to know, but I have read John Gill's enough to know. He clearly didn't read John Gill's enough to see that John Gill goes into new creation. But then Doug went through all the first day passages and just made a bunch of assertions that aren't even made by Christian theologians who have pointed to these passages and how they supplementally support why the church uh, worships on the first day. They're supplemental. They don't hinge on those verses. And again, he used the verbatim fallacy multiple times, showing he doesn't even understand the new creation whatsoever. Then he burned the straw man of, if God was going to change one of his commandments, he would have told us, completely missing that God himself does change the form of the fourth commandment between the first and second givings of the law. Which shows us that yes, the ceremonial form of the command can and has changed while the substance remains the same which is exactly what the Christian Sabbath position recognizes and believes. Then he asked if the apostles made this change or if they even had the authority to do such and said no, which is totally false because we see they had this authority in Acts 15 at the Jerusalem Council regarding circumcision, which utilizing Doug and the SDA church's own standard should have been eternal because it too was said to be forever. But nevertheless, he failed to even recognize that the only dated documented cases of Jesus corporately gathering after the resurrection are on the first day. He tried to say some of those were Monday and Thursday, etc. Jesus began this practice and teaching with the apostles who then handed it down to us today. He appealed to Jesus keeping the Sabbath, yet failed to recognize that Jesus changed that habit and that was in the old creation. Then he claimed we've changed the scriptures and cited Revelation 22 and said it applies to us, not to take away or the plagues of God will be added to you. Yet his own church's Bible paraphrase has altered that specific text by allowing for additions to to the Revelation as long as they aren't contradictory, as we looked at Jack Blanco's rendering. Then he launched into a whole chain of standard fair historical revisionism and conspiracy theories that are easily falsifiable, especially in the age of the internet followed by citing a silly poem with sappy music and loaded questions like, don't you just want to believe the Bible, friends? Just begging the question that his position is correct and to disagree means you don't believe the Bible. And all of that was supposed to be what refutes the first day Sabbath? Not even close. You didn't use the historical grammatical method of interpretation that Ted Wilson claims is the only approved interpretation method of your church, Doug? There was no walking through any of the texts examining the grammar and the historical context. There was no examining what the original audience that the texts were written to would have understood. You're going to have to do a lot better than that. Whether you agree with my position or not, hopefully this was beneficial to you. I know lots of Christians do not agree with me on this. That's fine. The purpose of this presentation was not to get into every aspect of whether or not the Sabbath was present in Eden, if the Ten Commandments transcend Sinai, etc. It was to demonstrate that this movement does not know what they criticize, and they leave people with phobia, irrational fear. Christian, you do not need to fear corporately gathering and worshiping on Sunday. These two streams were to show that the subject is a lot more complex and wide than the SDA church loves to paint to make it appear like Christians are just clueless and ignorant or they hate God. They're in a dazed and confused lull. And they're just in need of a simple, biblical, clear SDA truth that they have to share. Again, painting a caricature idea of what's actually going on. 
So hopefully this was beneficial to you. Thank you for being with me tonight. I had a pretty bad headache all evening. So sorry, that was kind of bugging me at some points. But thank you for being here. I want to remind you, you guys can also visit answeringadventism.com to partner with us, learn more about what we're doing, and so much more. So make sure to check that out. It is our gift to you. Believe the gospel, friends. The pure, undiluted gospel. Only the person and work of the true Christ can save. You cannot, uh, you cannot add anything to that. Obedience is a fruit of already being reconciled, not something that maintains one's peace with God. We are going to be rolling out more conversations with SDAs like we did on Monday, and you're going to see a recurring theme. Oh, well, my union with Christ is maintained by things I'm doing. <laughs> no, you, you don't get it. You don't get it. Jesus and Jesus alone provides that. You cannot add or take away from any of that. The Judaizers in Galatia only added one thing to the gospel, saying one had to get circumcised in order to truly come to Christ and have peace with God. Paul says they were under a curse from God because they changed the gospel, which resulted in no gospel at all. Health message, spirit of prophecy in Ellen White's writings, Young Earth Creationism, Seventh-day Sabbath, Investigative Judgment, none of that is the gospel message or what the apostles preached as the good news. If you are trusting in any of that to find peace with your maker, you will not find it. Trust in Christ alone, friends. As always, until next time, God bless.